high atop the forest-covered hills of Washington State, and a group of experienced hikers had made camp for their journey. They were ready for a night of rest and relaxation. Little did they know that lurking in the shadows was a mysterious figure that would soon put their courage to the test. Legend has it that those who have ventured deep around the ape caves have encountered something terrifying. As darkness descended, they were soon thrust into a terrifying experience they would never forget. Was it really Bigfoot stalking them in the night or just their imaginations running wild? Jacob and Stan had been planning their camping trip to Washington State for a while now. They were experienced. They were eager to take on the challenge of trekking through and near the ape caves. As they ventured deeper in the woods, they soon settled on an area near an old abandoned cabin as their site for camp. But little did they know that their peaceful night's rest would be disturbed by something far more sinister than any of them could have imagined. It was just after dusk when Stan noticed a set of strange tracks leading away from the campsite. Believing it to be too large for any normal animal, his friends exchanged word glances before turning back to search for signs of danger in the shadows. It was then that a low growl emitted and echoed through the night air, sending shivers up all of their spines. And suddenly, from behind a thicket, two yellow eyes appeared and began moving towards them with swiftness and agility. The creature continued prowling around the campsite for what seemed like hours before finally disappearing into the night without a trace. The group awoke to a strange sight the next morning. All around their campsite, huge tracks could be seen in the ground, as if an enormous creature had been pacing back and forth during night. Even more alarming were the broken tree branches they found at least eight to nine feet high on one of the nearby trees. It was clear that something not so ordinary had been lurking around their camp, and it was downright eerie to witness the power of this mysterious being. After quickly packing up and leaving, the men agreed that this was an experience they would never forget, and one that left them with more questions than answers about the existence of Bigfoot. Now, before their camping trip, these men had all heard stories of Ape Canyon and the legends surrounding it, but none of them had truly believed in the possibility of encountering such a thing until this fateful night. Even now, as they reflected on their experience, it almost seemed like a dream, too surreal to be real. Nonetheless, when they recalled the yellow eyes that stared back at them through the darkness or remembering the deep growl that reverberated around them, they knew without a shadow of a doubt that they had come face to face with the mythical beast known as Bigfoot. Still, feelings of awe, fear, and mystery remained with each of them as they tried to wrap their minds around what had happened that night. Now, if you even have a passing familiarity with the Bigfoot phenomenon, you likely know some of the landmark cases, the Patterson-Gimlin footage, the Ruby Creek incident, the Minnesota Iceman, etc., Cryptozoologists are quick to mention these events whenever making their case that large hairy hominids live alongside human beings in North America. Now, one of the more popular tales is the harrowing saga of Ape Canyon. It has been told time and time again in cryptozoological books and documentaries. In fact, you've probably heard this story, but you probably haven't heard the full story, which has largely been sanitized by cryptozoologists who wish to omit the strangest of details. According to the frightening tale, which burst onto the scene in July 16, 1924, the issue of the Oregonian newspaper, a group of five gold miners in Skamania County, Washington, endured a violent encounter with a troop of Ape men. <laughs> the attack seemed to have been instigated by a member of the crew named Hank. Damn it, Hank. Several days before, the men had encountered a host of oddities around their mining claim, including the creatures, which were described as seven feet tall, each weighing in an 
excess of 400 pounds. They left behind footprints that measured 13 to 14 inches long. And the day of the attack, Hank had taken three pot shots at one of the creatures, but had missed. Thanks again, Hank. You're doing great. It seems as if the Bigfoot did not appreciate this loving, warming gesture. When the men reconvened at their cabin on the southeast shoulder of Mount St. Helens, they all agreed that it seemed wise to return home, but had no desire to make the trek back to their vehicle in the darkness. I mean, I can't blame them. They decided to wait until the safety of daybreak. Now, all remained calm until around midnight, when a shocking blow landed against the wall of the cabin. Bam! Whatever had hit the building was so forceful that it dislodged some of the ceiling between the logs, known as chinking, raining it down on the men's chest. Hank was hit with an especially large chunk, disorienting him for a few moments before the others helped him to his feet. Now, outside the cabin, a rain of thunderous footfalls echoed in the chilly Washington evening. The men grabbed their rifles, fearing the worst. Although the building had no windows, the blow that had struck the cabin had now created plenty of small gaps where the chinking had fallen loose, allowing the miners to peer between the logs. And through one of these holes, Hank and the others were able to see three Bigfoot-like creatures huddled together, ready to assault the cabin. It sounded as if many more lurked in the background. The miners all agreed that, to avoid escalation, they should only open fire if the cabin seemed to be under direct attack. Two of the men cowered in the corner. The other three stood at the ready, awaiting whatever came next. If a truce existed between the Bigfoot and the men, it was short-lived. It wasn't long until something large could be heard on the roof, not simply walking, but moving with a forceful intent. It seemed as if it wished to bring the cabin down on top of the men. In response, they fired their weapons through the ceiling. Then came an assault upon the front door, far worse than the IRS demanding their payment. The creature were trying to bash it down, forcing the defenders to brace it with a large pole or board taken from one of the bunk beds. Even this did not seem to deter the assault, forcing the men to turn the cabin's door into Swiss cheese with their own rifles. The siege dragged on for hours, and throughout the ordeal, heavy stones and boulders flung with great force smashed against the outside walls, causing them to tremble. The miners were only allowed a few moments of rest between each attack. One of these quiet interludes was interrupted when the men noticed a large hairy hand reaching through the newly created space between the logs. The hideous appendage was reaching for the handle of the axe. After it grasped onto the weapon, one of the men, thinking quickly and unable to pry it from the vice-like grip, turned the axe vertically, creating a puzzle that the Bigfoot was incapable of solving. As it tried to pull the axe out of the cabin, Hank fired at the hand. Bam! Now, although it missed the creature, probably Hank, the creature dropped the weapon and retreated back outside. Finally, activity seemed to finally calm down just before daybreak. With an abundance of caution, the five miners carefully stepped out of the cabin and surveyed the damage. It wasn't long before they set off in the direction of their vehicle. Minutes into the trip, one of the creatures was spotted some 80 yards away, standing by the edge of the canyon. This time, the miner's aim was true, because it probably wasn't Hank, and the Bigfoot was apparently struck. It teetered for a moment before careening over the cliff and into the gorge, landing some 400 feet below their feet. Now this, and the broadest of strokes, is the Ape Canyon story, as you will hear it from mainstream cryptozoologists. Yet former Michigan Governor Chase Osborne highlighted the island's nation's terrifying folklore in his 1924 book, Madagascar, Land of the Man-Eating Tree. Osborne's book republished a narrative from an old letter penned in 1874 by Carl Leich, a German traveler addressed to his Polish acquaintance. To the letter, Carl and another man by the name of Hendrik befriended a mysterious tribe of pygmies known as the Makotos. 
After earning their trust, the people eventually extended an invitation to the outsiders to attend said ritual. Now, Carl and Hendrick accepted and soon found themselves following the Makoto deep into the jungles. Eventually, they came to a bend in the stream, alongside which stretched a wide clearing. There, in the center, sat the dreaded plant. It was shaped like a pineapple, about eight feet tall, and seemed to have bark as strong as the finest iron. Now, atop the tree grew eight leaves, each about a dozen feet long. Carl and Hendrick cautiously examined the plant from a distance, noting unique details about these leaves. The inner side of each appendage seemed covered in spikes or spines like those of a cactus or a teasel. Each leaf terminated in a bowl-like depression atop the tree, which seemed filled with some sort of viscous fluid. From this bowl sprouted another set of fuzzy green tendrils, seven feet long apiece, sticking out in all directions. These were in addition to a third set of growths, white or transparent, which waved in the air like ball of snakes. The ritual began. From the crowd, the Makoto snatched a young girl, dragging her closer to the tree. The entire crowd raised their voices in a chant as they forced her to climb the trunk towards certain doom. Half willing, half hesitant, she was urged into the bowl of thick fluid where she took a long drink from the substance that lay pooled at her feet. Carl described what happened next. The slender, delicate palpi with the fury of starved serpents quivered a moment over her head. Then, as if instinct with demoniac intelligence, fastened upon her in sudden coils round and round her neck and arms. Then, with her awful screams and yet more awful laughter, rose wildly to be instantly strangled down again into a gurgling moan. The tendrils, one after another, like great green serpents, with brutal energy and infernal rapidity, rose, retracted themselves, and wrapped her about in fold after fold, ever tightening with cruel swiftness and savage tenacity of anacondas fastening upon their prey. At this point, the leaves stationary throughout the whole affair began to twitch rising up to seal the girl completely in her grisly tomb. All of the plant's appendages tightened, compressing the girl with the sickening crunches. As it did so, her blood and bodily fluids began to seep between the leaves, mixing with the sticky sap to flow in reddish-brown streams down the trunk of the tree. The plant was satisfied. There was no immediate threat. Now the second half of the ritual began unfolding before Carl and Hendrick's horrified eyes. The Makoto people rushed towards the placated plant, gathering the fluid in cups in their hands or directly into their mouths. As they drank the mixture of blood and plant juice, the tribe became immediately intoxicated, leaving the scene to devolve into what Carl described as a grotesque and indescribably hideous orgy. Carl and Hendrick excused themselves, fleeing to the peaceful security of their tents. And over the coming days, they revisited the tree, noting how its appendages remained coiled around the girl for 10 days. After the 10th day, the Makoto tribe descended upon the ritual site once more, where the tree now sat open, ready for another victim. And there, at the foot of the tree, sat the girl's white skull, gleaming bright in the sunshine. Chase Osborne presented the letter with more than a hint of agnosticism, writing, I do not know whether this tigerish tree really exists or whether the blood-curdling stories about it are pure myth and fiction. It is enough for my purpose if its story focuses your interest upon one of the least known spots of the world, Madagascar. However, Osborne also claimed to have seen a similar, smaller plant in his travels to London. He described a specimen housed at the London Horticultural Hall that consumed a mouse after it fell into a hole in its stem. Although Osborne claimed that the plant, which supposedly came from India, had not been classified as belonging to any known botanical species. It sounds very much as if he was describing a pitcher plant a type of carnivorous plant that we all know exists. 
Whatever he saw, this incident led Osborne to believe that the existence of the man-eating tree of Madagascar was possible, if not probable. Now, Carl Lyke's letter is certainly a riveting tale. It has since come under a great deal of suspicion. However, in his 1955 book, Salamanders and Other Wonders Science, author Willie Lay tried his best to track down not only Carl Lyke, but Madagascar's man-eating tree and the Makoto tribe as well. Well, unfortunately, he found no evidence that any of them ever existed, concluding that the facts are pretty clear by now. Of course, the man-eating tree does not exist. There is no such tribe. Whether or not the 1874 Carl Lyke letter was a hoax, stories continued to emerge describing plants possessed of a taste for human flesh. One noteworthy account surfaced in the August 27, 1892 issue of the Illustrated London News describing a vampire vine found in Nicaragua. The report offered by Dr. Andrew Wilson read as follows. It appears that a naturalist a Mr. Dunstan by name was botanizing in one of the swamps surrounding the Nicaragua Lake. The account goes on to relate that while hunting for specimens, he heard his dog cry out as if in agony from a distance. Running to the spot whence the animal cries came, Mr. Dunstan found him enveloped in a perfect network of what seemed to be fine rope-like tissue of roots and fibers. The plant or vine seemed composed entirely of bare, interlacing stems, resembling more than anything else the branches of a weeping willow, denuded of its foliage, but of a dark, nearly black hue, and covered with a thick, viscid gum that exuded from the pores. Drawing his knife, Mr. Dunstan attempted to cut the poor beast free, but it was with the very greatest difficulty that he managed to sever the fleshy, muscular fibers of the plant. When the dog was extracted from the coils of the plant, Mr. Dunstan saw to his horror that its body was bloodstained, while the skin appeared to be actually sucked or puckered in spots, and the animal staggered as if from exhaustion. In cutting the vine, the twigs curled like living, sinuous fingers of about Mr. Dunstan's hand, and it required no slight force to free the member from their clinging grasp, which left the flesh red and blistered. The tree, it seems, is well known to the natives, who relate many stories of its death-dealing powers. Its appetite is voracious and insatiable, and in five minutes it will suck the nourishment out of a large lump of meat, rejecting the carcass as a spider does, that of a used-up fly. September 12th, 1952. At around 7 p.m., Edward and Fred May, two brothers playing football outside, were shocked when they saw a pulsating, blazing ball of fire streak across the sky, crashing into the hilly woods on a nearby farm owned by G. Bailey Fisher. The boys were shocked by what they had seen and ran to their neighbor's house, uh, Kathleen May, to tell her what had happened. Well, Kathleen had gathered a group of people, including local children Neil Nunley and Ronnie Shaver and 17-year-old Eugene Lemon and his dog to all go and investigate the area in question. The entire group mustered the courage to go and check out what had now just crashed into the Earth. Could it have been a spaceship, an asteroid? They weren't sure, but they were going to find out. As they made their way up the hill onto the farm, the group was filled with apprehension apprehension and fear, not knowing what they would find out there in the dark and eerie woods. They had no idea that what they were about to experience would go down in history as one of the strangest and most frightening things to happen in West Virginia. You won't believe what this group witnessed, which I'll reveal shortly, so stick with me. The entire group reached the top of the thickly wooded hills to see something truly bizarre, something they could have only ever imagined coming out of a science 
fiction novel, a pulsating red light. And upon gazing at it, the entire group was suddenly overcome by a profound, nauseating stench that, as they described, was metallic. At this point, the dog they had brought with them was freaking out, snarling and barking, but also clearly terrified, with its tail between its legs. All of them were terrified out of their minds, having no idea what lay before them. Is shining and moving the flashlight rapidly in the dark, searching for whatever it was that lay in front of them. Before they knew it, their flashlights landed on something they all could not explain. They fled for their lives, completely terrified by what they had just witnessed, and as soon as they all get back home, they all experience severe symptoms, like swelling of the throat, convulsions, and severe nausea, just to name a few. It was so bad that it had been compared to the symptoms of someone who had encountered mustard gas by a medical professional, specifically one who had examined them. To make matters even more depressing, the dog that had been with them had allegedly begun vomiting uncontrollably and mysteriously dropped dead. And from here on out, Flatwoods, West Virginia was plunged into chaos. Almost immediately the following day, law enforcement was set out to the site of the incident in question, but found no corroborating evidence for anything that was taken down by the entire group of witnesses. Authorities found no trace or any sign at all of a strange pulsating light, nor any sign of the metallic stench, and certainly nothing out of the ordinary. This is what, of course, what was put in the newspaper and all the local media. However, it wouldn't be long before other media groups picked up on it and it was just blown up. Many people started sparking rumors that this was a UFO cover-up and that there were actually skid marks and other strange signs at the landing location of the craft, etc. Apparently, a reporter by the name of A. Lee Stewart Jr. had found a handful of these bits of evidence, including but not limited to strange plastic-like material. Investigators who went there after sighting stated that there was an unusual smell or odor in that area. And it was said that the trees in the area were singed at the top there were investigators who said that branches actually were broken. Now, it wasn't long before it became even more sensationalized, far beyond belief, when others began chiming in that they, too, saw a strange object streaking across the night sky that same night. And it soon made its way to all the newspapers, and so multiple UFO and paranormal investigators swarmed the area to investigate, including Gray Barker, John Keel, and Ivan T. Sanderson, to name a few. These bizarre accounts started coming out of nowhere into the public eye. One woman in particular had claimed to have seen the same thing this group had just seen a few weeks prior. Another witness stepped forward and claimed that her house had reverberated and had been violently shaken by some mysterious force that same night. Another report had come in from a local couple that were driving down the highway just hours before the event when they all noticed this horrible metallic odor followed by a strong disrupting electrical charge. Right afterward, the couple described what they witnessed, this otherworldly reptilian looking creature floating across the road before them. But it gets even more bizarre from here. A Mrs. May claimed that the day after this event occurred, she was actually accosted by two mysterious looking men who claimed they were reporters and asked her to to show the site at which this happened. Afterward, these men emerged from the trees with what Mrs. May described as a strange oily substance on their clothing. Even National Guard Commander of West Virginia by the name of Dale Leavitt claimed that in the late 1990s, he had thoroughly examined the area with 50 other Air Force personnel and found two strange things. The first being a six meter circle of depressed grass and also a strange mysterious oily substance. Substance. The events of September 12th were not just exclusive to Flatwoods, West Virginia. There were sightings of UFOs in at least 
12 other states. Hundreds of reports of unidentified flying objects. Because of this, Ivan T. Sanderson was the one who publicly speculated due to the numerous other UFO reports, an entire fleet of alien craft might have been passing through. Now, as the years went on, the original witnesses to the event would stick and hold to their story. All had remained adamant about what they had witnessed that evening, and it has now become one of the most famous sightings of the paranormal to date. But what exactly did they see out there? Was it just some UFO craft, perhaps an asteroid, or something far more strange? This will blow your mind. On the night of September 12th, 1952, as the group was investigating what they thought was an asteroid or possibly a UFO crash, their flashlights were met with something bizarre. Got a heaven, no legs or prongs sticking down to hold it up, and it moved. We figured about 10, 10 to 12 feet. I've always described it as two like portholes on a boat. Then I know I was afraid to go outside for a month after that, especially at night. What they would describe as a shining pair of eyes similar to that of a nocturnal animal. As their eyes adjusted to the darkness, this mysterious new being came into view and they could all make out that they witnessed a massive humanoid figure, roughly 10 feet tall, with what they all described as having a fiery red face and glowing yellow eyes set within. What's even more bizarre is the shape and anatomy of what they saw. Its head seemed to be shaped like a spade with flickering lights and small clawed hands. The body was black and green and cylindrical. There was also mention of what appeared to be folds similar to draped fabric or even molded metal, all within the mist or fog. You can only imagine the confusion and utter terror the entire group experienced as they laid eyes upon this mysterious entity. However, this entity emitted a bizarre sound within moments. The witnesses described it as something between a hiss and a high pitched squeal which then glided right towards them with a throbbing thumping kind of noise this sent the witnesses running for their lives and would be the catalyst for all events from here while the story in question sounds compelling and terrifying there are several persuasive skeptical arguments that we can look at the first is that this could be a mixture of misidentification and coincidence perhaps that night there was a meteor that could have been mistaken to have crash landed in the wooded hills by eyewitnesses. Many of them who claimed to have seen the light in the sky described it as a meteor, not a UFO. I mean, it's possible that in this hysteria, they would jump to conclusions and connected the two. As this small group went to investigate the dark hills, the ominous foggy atmosphere made it the perfect setting for a misidentification. They possibly witnessed one of the three aircraft warning hazard beacons that are completely visible up on that hill, and in conjunction with the meteor, assumed it was a UFO. Even the entity they claimed to have seen might just be a misidentification of a large barn owl perched high up on a tree. Hopped up on adrenaline, spooked, and going in with a preconceived notion that they were about to stumble upon something from outer space, the witnesses may misidentify the owl and the perch it was on as one singular entity. I mean, visibility was already poor with the fog, and it all seems like the perfect setup for a horror movie scene. It's easy for the human mind to set ourselves up for something we don't actually see. Then the owl, startled by the witnesses, flew off right past them in the night, letting out a distinctive shrill cry. This is supposedly what the witnesses had mistaken as an alien entity flying at them. I mean, many of the features that a barn owl has does coincide with the eyewitness descriptions of the entity. There are similarities, and it is a possibility. Now, I'm not stating that this is precisely what happened. I'm just saying it's a possibility. But what about the strange oily residue and track marks that were found? Is it possible that a tractor in the area around the time of the sighting left it behind? Perhaps the oily substance leaked from said tractor. Even the foul odor had been written off as the smell of a specific kind of grass native to this area. People talked about, oh, maybe it was a possum, maybe it was a, a buck deer, and so forth. They're just responding to the shining eyes. Nickel believes that what the witnesses saw was distorted by their emotional state. If you've got a mindset, if you're, if you're expecting to see something, that will affect what you see. When they see something then that's frightening, some shining eyes, 
that quick comes at them. I don't think they had time to think, but simply to react. Skeptic Joel Nickel wrote a complete deconstruction of the case for the Skeptical Inquirer. It was so well written that many Fordian researchers agree and have concluded that this is more than likely what happened. Part of what I had mentioned was actually taken from the same article, you know, about the meteor, the owl, etc. And it is worth reading the whole thing below. Another big issue that skeptics have with this story is the descriptions given by the various witnesses. What they describe seems to indicate something mechanical by nature rather than some sort of horrifying extraterrestrial entity. For example, Example, Gray Barker, who is also noted at the time as the occasional prankster, claimed that having visited the area in question only 30 minutes after the initial encounter by the group, he only found an empty, quiet forest with no signs or evidence of anything out of the ordinary ever happened. Of course, even Ivan Sanderson's reputation was being critiqued at the time, considering he was allegedly claiming that there were these large three-toed prints found along a beach supposedly belonging to a giant penguin species. Even the supposed fleet of UFO crafts seen in other states were written off casually for being constituents of a annual meteor shower, which, you guessed it, occur in early September. But this isn't a case of a story presented and concluded falsely. Some of the eyewitness descriptions of the illuminations change. There is a farmer on an adjacent hill a few miles away from where the encounter happened, and he claimed that he observed a brightly lit spot on the hill for an extended period. This farmer grew gravely concerned that a forest fire had happened and was watching intently for several minutes with a pair of binoculars until the area vanished into a single point of light. If you ever get a chance to visit Chattanooga, Tennessee, you might want to add Ruby Falls to your list. A trip to this cave affords sightseers the opportunity to see some of the best known formations from stalagmites and stalactites to gorgeous flowstone columns and drapery all formed painstakingly over the course of years. The trip underground culminates in one of the most impressive subterranean sites you will ever see. A 145 foot tall waterfall, a 1100 feet underground, cascading from the ceiling into a pool below. You might also experience something beyond the natural world. You see, Ruby Falls Cave was discovered in the 1920s by local chemist and spelunking enthusiast Leo Lambert, who knew that some sort of geologic wonder was hidden within Lookout Mountain. After all, there had once been a natural entrance to another cave, Lookout Mountain Cave, but that was closed in 1905 due to railroad construction. Now, Leo toiled day and night to find a suitable entrance into the subterranean passageways. He purchased land on Lookout Mountain for the express purpose of locating an alternate entrance. In 1928, he succeeded, his drills penetrating far enough to reveal an entryway four feet wide but only 18 inches tall. Leo bravely squeezed inside, finding larger openings underneath. In the coming months, he discovered the waterfall, naming it after his wife, Ruby. On December 30th, 1929, Ruby Falls opened to the public. This opening, however, came with a price. Sometime between the discovery of the waterfall and the opening of the tourist attraction, Leo's assistants began pushing further and further into the cave, exploring every dark recess in the hope that they might discover another hidden wonder. One of these explorers was a seasoned spelunker by the name of Lomax. One day, while probing the furthest reaches of Ruby Falls Cave, Lomax discovered a small, gap in the walls. Exercising more courage than caution, he pressed himself through the fissure and was rewarded with an amazing find. An undiscovered chamber, tall enough to stand upright in, about the size of a living room. Lomax found an exit from this chamber into an even larger space, one which featured several other passageways branching off from it. Lomax, however, had gone too far and not kept track of his equipment. His light winked out, stranding him in the pitch black darkness of the cave. 
If you have never been underground, you might not fully appreciate just how terrifying this all can be. What we call complete darkness on the surface almost always has a little ambient light involved. It creeping through the cracks underneath and to the side of doors, underground there is no light whatsoever. Add to this the fear of becoming stuck in possible cave-ins, and the combination is downright terrifying. Lomax tried his best to remain calm, knowing that a search party would be organized as soon as he failed to return in a timely fashion. I mean, sure enough, his fellow explorers began looking for Lomax before the day was done. However, their calls went unanswered, and they scoured every nook and cranny of Ruby Falls for hours until at last they perceived indications of his trail. They followed it to the lost explorer. Lomax did not seem himself. He sat along a wall in one of these smaller chambers, staring forward into the darkness. He could have easily responded to their calls, but the only thing he seemed capable of vocalizing was a string of incoherent babble tumbling from his mouth. Right away, Lomax's rescuers knew that something was terribly wrong. He was completely unresponsive. At great effort, they brought him to his feet and led him back toward the surface. Eventually, his gibberish became more comprehensible. Lomax kept repeating, do not go further into the cave, do not go further into the cave. Lomax was taken to the nearest hospital where he slowly but surely recovered from the days that had settled upon him. Now that he was once more lucid, his fellow explorers pressured him on exactly what he had encountered. Lomax refused to offer any explanation other than he could never be convinced to return to the depths of Ruby Falls Cave again. In the coming days, his hair turned completely white and soon enough, Lomax had moved away from Chattanooga never to return. What do you think he saw? The chamber which Lomax had discovered was eventually found again, its entrance widened to accommodate tourists. After it was open to the public, this portion of the tour always generated strange rumors. Some guides swore that human bones had been discovered in the chamber. Other visitors experienced Lomax's terror firsthand. It is common practice on cave and cavern tours for guides to douse the lights, to give visitors a sense of how complete the darkness can be underground. Lomax's chamber once served as the exact spot where this part of the tour took place. And on several occasions, tour members were frightened out of their wits. Once the lights came back on, they all shared the same story. A set of icy cold fingers would reach around their necks as if to strangle the life out of them. While one possible explanation might be that fellow tourists are playing pranks on people in the dark, in these stories, there is never anyone close enough to the victims when the lights turn back on. Anyone touching another visitor in the dark would have to flee in complete darkness across a rough, uneven rocky floor, risking at least a twisted ankle. Simply put, the conditions in the cave make human pranksters a very unlikely possibility. Eventually, Enough of these stories led the managers of Ruby Falls Cave to close Lomax's chamber in the 1940s. It was sealed off completely, and poor record keeping or the deliberate attempt to forget the location entirely means that the exact spot is now lost to memory. The story lingers on in the form of vague tales from tour guides who might share Lomax's terrifying tale, if you ask nicely enough. As noted, Ruby Falls sits within Tennessee's Lookout Mountain. It casts an imposing figure over the landscape and enjoys perhaps the highest density of hauntings of any landmark in America's Mid-South. This is the Gray Man of Hatteras, a benevolent specter sometimes said to be the spirit of a man who died during a sudden flood which swept that stretch of the coast. Ever since this untimely demise, he has appeared countless times to help, 
author and Outer Banks resident Charles Harry Whidbey called the Gray Man just as dependable as a barometer. He loves his people and wants to protect them from harm. One notable Gray Man sighting took place in 1966 during rough seas brought by Hurricane Faith. As per protocol, the Cape Hatteras Coast Guard was patrolling the beach, warning people of the incoming storm. And four days before Labor Day, apprentice Seaman Brooks and his detachment were finishing their rounds along Cape Point's beach when the men spotted, standing in the dunes, an old man swinging his arms wildly. It looked as if he were encouraging them to take cover or offering them fish sticks. I mean, we all know we can trust the Gorton's fishermen. All of the detachments save one were Islanders and knew exactly who they were seeing, the Gray Man of Hatteras. The Mainlander, on the other hand, ran towards the figure shouting warnings for him to get off the beach. When he got within 10 feet, the Gray Man turned, looked him in the eye, and simply vanished. He left behind no trace, not even footprints. The rest of the patrol explained to their enthusiastic co-worker what had just transpired. A little further down the beach on Hatteras, down by the Cape itself, dwells yet another mystery. A little white cloud is said to often hover above the waters, always in the same place, regardless of the weather. Supposedly, it is only absent during storms or heavy cloud coverage when it blends in with the rest of the sky. Otherwise, it simply hovers happily in the ocean breeze. The conventional explanation, but not the fun one, holds that heavy condensation generated by two strong ocean currents, which collide at the tip of the island, produce the little cloud. Local legends tell a different story. But that's not where the mysterious legends end for North Carolina. For you see, it gets much weirder. For example, Croatoan. Have you ever heard that word? It is the only solidly that we have in one of the earliest American mysteries. In fact, the first disappearance of settlers in the New World. Just off the mainland of North Carolina, the Roanoke colony vanished without a trace in 1590, and today it is known as the Lost Colony. It is only one of hundreds of mysteries surrounding the North Carolina coast and the Outer Banks. In fact, many people associate a life by the ocean with a carefree, give-and-take lifestyle. I mean, while it's true that daydreams of becoming a beach bum tempt many of us, we often overlook the sacrifices involved. I mean, oceanfront property brings with it privacy issues, and don't forget the constant influx of obnoxious tourists and yuppies. These, however, are small prices to pay compared to the effect of the environment on personal possessions. I mean, even the very air takes its toll. Salt water, constantly thrown up as sea spray, corrodes metal five times faster than fresh water. I mean, this puts anything outside made of metal at constant risk, including your car, from the body to the frame to the undercarriage. Thoughtful maintenance is a must. Then, of course, you have to deal with Mother Nature herself. Without any landmass or force to slow them down, you receive the full brunt of storms as they make landfall. Now, depending on where you are located, you might live half of each year under the threat of hurricanes, which in the past 42 years alone have caused more than $1 trillion in property damage and have been directly responsible for the deaths of around 7,000-ish people. I mean, even smaller storms bring with them the threat of flooding, which, at the very least, means that your insurance costs will be sky high compared to those living further inland. Long story short, a life at the beach isn't a day at the beach. It can be dangerous. And few beach dwellers grasp this truth better than the people of the Outer Banks. Now, this popular tourist destination is a chain of barrier islands. They are primarily located along the North Carolina coast, precariously situated between the ocean to the east and vast sounds to the west. The Outer Banks are exceptionally fragile. Some of the narrowest parts have only 150 yards separating the sound from the ocean. Each successive hurricane threatens to obliterate them entirely. 
And over the past 20 years, areas of the Outer Banks have lost over 200 feet due to erosion and currently see a loss of around 13 feet each year. Now, time and weather will destroy them. It is only a matter of time. And thankfully, they avoided at least one disaster. The Outer Banks does not have a Sabaro. With such adversities facing the region, it is unsurprising that the Outer Banks provided fertile ground for all variety of myths and legends. I mean, even the waters around them were notoriously dangerous. Robbers on shore deliberately set up lights imitating those of ships, hoping to force captains to run around, spilling their valuable cargo across the beach. Off the coast of Cape Hatteras sit the Diamond Shoals, an ever-shifting pattern of sandbars that have sunk so many ships, the area has earned the nickname the Graveyard of the Atlantic. Simply put, people on the Outer Banks were well aware of the fragility of life, meaning that death and the paranormal were just around every corner. Mysteries popped up as soon as settlers made landfall. In fact, one of America's oldest mysteries unfolded here on these isolated isles. The story of the lost colony, mentioned earlier, took place on Roanoke Island, which lies between the Outer Banks and the mainland. Although many compelling theories have been proposed over the years, exactly what happened to those 115 missing colonists remains inconclusive. Roanoke Colony marked the first attempt at a permanent English settlement in North America. It may have been cursed from the start. Governor Ralph Lane originally established it in 1585 on Roanoke Island in modern Dare County, only to suffer various setbacks, like the colony had a tense relationship with the indigenous population and was drastically undersupplied. In June of 1586, the colonists made contact with the passing fleet of British war hero and privateer, Sir Francis Drake, who left them with four months of supplies and one of his ships. All were lost to a hurricane, however, and the colony was in a bind. A relief fleet with an entire year's worth of supplies was due soon, but that didn't help anyone in the short term. Eventually, the decision was made to evacuate the island, with nearly everyone, including Lane, returning with Drake to England. Only three people were left behind to greet the incoming fleet. They should have just held out a little longer. A single emergency supply ship sent by Sir Walter Raleigh arrived days after Drake helped with the evacuation. No sign of the three colonists could be found, and two weeks later, the relief fleet by Sir Richard Grenville arrived with supplies and 400 men, but they too found no one on those sandy shores. Now, Grenville returned to England, leaving behind a 15-man detachment to guard Sir Walter Raleigh's claim, and they too fell upon misfortune, because according to indigenous informants interrogated later, they were attacked by an alliance of hostile tribes, who killed two of them. Now, the remaining Englishmen piled into a boat to escape and were never heard from again. Now, rumor has it that the weather started getting rough and the tiny ship was tossed. But some speculate that they sat down on the shore of an uncharted desert isle where they had no phone, no lights, no motor car, not a single luxury. Despite these ominous setbacks, the English were determined to establish a foothold on the eastern coast of North America. In 2020, a woman walking her dog on South Carolina Beach, known as Sunrise Park, would stumble upon a skeleton. But this wouldn't be just an animal skeleton or even a human skeleton. In fact, many people who have looked at the video recorded of this mysterious skeleton are unsure of what it could belong to. What the heck is this? Um, she's the one that actually found it, my dog River. I, I saw her picking at something like with her nose and I, that's what made me walk over there. At first, I really wasn't sure what it was. It could be the size of like a small dog. It definitely wasn't a dog. I thought somebody would be like, oh, it's like, um, you know, like a, a seal. And then I'd go about my day, but it stumped a lot of people. I had no idea. I have never came across something like this. There are some theories that have been tossed around that it could have been a skeleton of a seal or, I don't know, even a chupacabra. 
The skeleton itself has never been identified, and there is a common thread that connects this unknown skeleton to the mysterious Morgan Island and its potential deadly experiments. Could this skeleton belong to an otherworldly creature that originally resided in the island? Many researchers and witnesses can never ignore the mystery of the isolated Morgan Island, especially when it comes to theories of the origin of strange creatures or where they may inhabit. And unfortunately, I don't think these questions will be answered to the general public anytime soon. As Morgan Island remains a solitary patch of land where any human trespassing is highly illegal, South Carolina has been found to be an underrated vacation spot for many. Now with this state, you can explore beaches, woods, and more. Now Hunting Island State Park in South Carolina has been the most recent setting when it comes to spotting Bigfoot creatures. Daniel, a self-proclaimed woodsman had a terrifying experience that he cannot rationalize or explain in the Hunting Island National Park in South Carolina. After Daniel settled into his campsite, he began to do the normal thing, like set up his tent and get firewood and prepare his dinner. And all the while doing so, dusk soon began to settle over his camp and the nightlife began to come to life, easing him into a false sense of security. Now that security would soon be ripped away as he would get this tingling, almost itching, bothering sensation that something just wasn't quite right. Now he couldn't explain it right away, but he just figured maybe it was his nerves or maybe there had to be an explanation, of course. So he continued on like normal, made his dinner, enjoyed himself, had a nice cigar by the end and retired to bed. Now it wasn't till closer to midnight or one in the morning when Daniel was awakened by a strange clicking noise outside of his tent. Being slightly unnerved and also curious, he grabs his flashlight, steps outside of his tent, and shines it in the direction that the mysterious clicking noises are coming from, and lo and behold, what he witnesses terrifies him. Now, Daniel describes what he saw as this. He claimed he saw this naked, all-white, person or what he thought was a person that he explained had really long arms and legs standing over by a tree looking in his direction. But what he also described as haunting and terrifying is that this person who was again not only naked and hairless but did not appear to have any genitalia and the eyes were almost like this sapphire glowing blue. And in fact as soon as this thing saw that he was looking at it it raised its arms out to him, almost as if beckoning him to come. Now, completely petrified by what Daniel has just seen and he's screaming his head off, he quickly darts back in his tent, holding on to the only weapon he has, which was a measly pocket knife. I mean, Daniel didn't think he would need any heavy firepower on this one night camping trip in a safe national park. And now he was practically crapping bricks. The next thing that Daniel can recall is the clicking growing louder and louder as whatever what he just saw had now approached his tent slowly and methodical. And now the clicking was growing in not only intensity and volume, but it sounded like it was crescendoing and more clicking was coming around his tent as if there were more of them. And then the next thing he recalls is that he had fell unconscious. Now here is where it gets even crazier. He awakes the following morning having no signs of anything strange going on. But within the following couple few days afterwards, he develops some strange medical conditions like these strange rashes that appear all over his body. He begins having seizures almost two to three times a week at completely random, followed by a string of bad luck he just can't seem to shake off. Now he is still dealing with all these medical conditions that have just popped up in the recent years since this experience happened back in 2018. He believes that whatever this was had marked him and is the reason for all of his unfortunate luck. So my question is, did Daniel truly come across something conspiratorial or something that the government or military knows about in South Carolina's national parks? 
In fact, the government of South Carolina has claimed there are about 80,000 acres of land in the state that has been left untouched by the human hand. So, I mean, this begs us to ask the question, what can be living among these unexplored and uninhabited parts of land? I mean, after all, South Carolina is known to have expansive areas of nature and wildlife. James Tedford, a war veteran in his 50s, lived in the quiet town of Fletchertown, Vermont, with his young, beautiful wife, Pearl. They seemed like an ordinary couple, but their lives took a strange turn when James went off to fight in World War II, because when he returned for his second tour of duty, he had no idea that he was about to experience a bizarre and unexplainable event that would shock the entire town. Now, before James left, he and Pearl had a very happy life. There were hardly any marital problems. They had a great time spending time together. And of course, they were very much in love. So when he returned, he was looking forward to picking up where he had left off. However, fate had other plans in store. For you see, James arrived home to an empty house with virtually no sign of Pearl anywhere. His initial assumption was that she had just stepped out momentarily. As the evening wore on, she still had not returned, and James began to really worry about what was happening. The house was spotless, and there was even a half-prepared meal just left out there on the counter, which was very unusual. James began asking around town, hoping somebody knew about Pearl's whereabouts. It was discovered that she had actually been seen at a nearby store seemingly in great spirits and exhibiting no signs of obvious distress or worry. However, Pearl never returned home and the police were unable to find any clues as to her whereabouts. In fact, many people in the town believed that Pearl had simply run off to start another life with another man. But James could not accept that explanation. Why would she leave behind a half-prepared meal and not just leave a note behind? None of it made sense. It was as if she had simply just vanished off the face of the earth. And James was left with no answers and even worse, no closure. What happens will not only disturb you, but there's a much larger plot twist at play here that will blow your mind, so stick with me. Now, Tedford's life was turned upside down by the mysterious disappearance of his beloved wife. He withdrew from the world and became extremely reclusive, dealing with horrendous amounts of grief, barely able to leave the home, spending most of his time alone staring at the wall succumbing to his most depressing thoughts. Eventually, he decided to move into the soldier's retirement home in Bennington, Vermont, where he kept to himself and pretty much had no friends. In fact, the only real people left in James's life were some relatives who lived up in St. Albans, Vermont, and he would occasionally make the long trip out to visit them. And in December of 1949, he went to visit his family as usual, and everything seemed relatively normal. However, when he went to the bus station to take the trip back to his retirement home, something strange had happened. James was his usual self, but he wasn't acting any differently than usual. And so, like normal, he boarded the bus along with all the other passengers like normal, and the journey began as usual. However, somewhere along the way, James just vanished without a trace. No one saw him leave the bus and there was no signs of him anywhere. In fact, the other passengers and the bus driver all searched the bus and the surrounding area, but James was nowhere to be found. So the police were called, an investigation was then launched, but still there were virtually no clues. It was literally as if James had just evaporated into thin air. Now the disappearance of James Tedford added to the already existing mystery surrounding the town of Bennington, Vermont. Many people people began to speculate about what had happened to him, but no one had any concrete answers, clues, or leads to what could have happened. The strange and unexplainable event left everyone puzzled and wondering if they would ever find out what really did happen to James. Bus personnel and the 15 passengers who had been on the same bus as Tedford confirmed that he had indeed boarded the bus, and his luggage and belongings were found still stowed away on the bus. Witnesses said that Tedford had actually been sleeping 
sleeping soundly in his seat and seemed like any other passenger on the bus. However, it's when the bus arrived at its destination that Tedford was nowhere to be found. This was really puzzling because the bus had made no stops along the way. It was literally from point A to point B with no stopping between. So any speculation that he hit on the bus or that he somehow got off on a stop that he wasn't supposed to kind of goes out the window. And of course, there's really no way for James to exit a moving vehicle without anybody noticing. Furthermore, it had been snowing heavily at the time, making it even more unlikely that he would have just jumped off the bus. Again, he just vanished into thin air without a trace. The disappearance of James Tedford was a baffling mystery that left everybody wondering. How could someone disappear in full view of a crowded bus of people with so many potential witnesses? And why had all of his belongings just been left behind? As the days turned into weeks and then months, there was still no sign of James at all. The strange and unexplainable event had left everyone in the town of Bennington, Vermont, wondering if they would ever find out what really happened. And to this day, James Tedford has never been heard from again, and the mystery of his disappearance continues to remain unsolved. But here's the plot twist. It isn't just the fact that James and his wife disappeared that haunts the area and town. It's a piece of a mystery that's much larger and far more disturbing. People have actually been going missing around this particular area for years. In fact, it was first brought to the public's attention by American author Joseph A. Citro. It is said that between the years of 1945 and 1950, numerous people vanished without a trace, their fates forever lost within the shadows of the triangle. Citro's tales of these disappearances and the area's rich folklore have captivated readers in his books, including the chilling narrative of Shadow Child. The boundaries of this so-called mystery triangle remain as elusive as its secrets, but the region is believed to be centered around Glastonbury Mountain, encompassing the nearby towns of Bennington, Woodford, Shaftesbury, and Somerset. This enigmatic area shares striking similarities with another mysterious region, the Bridgewater Triangle in southern Massachusetts. Now, long ago, Glastonbury and its neighboring township, Somerset, bustled with activity from logging and other various industrial endeavors. However, as the years wore on, the towns began to decline, and by the late 19th century, they had started their slow descent into oblivion. In 1937, the Vermont General Assembly officially unincorporated both Glastonbury and Somerset, and now these once thriving communities are just little more than ghost towns, echoes of a bygone era. There has been so many disappearances that the area has earned a name called the Bennington Triangle. The first disappearance in 1945 occurred in the forested mountains near Glastonbury Mountain. Mitty Rivers, a 74-year-old experienced hunter, was out on a hunting trip with a group of four companions when he suddenly vanished without a trace. As the group was making their way back to camp, Rivers had gone ahead of the others and seemingly disappeared into thin air. Now, a search was immediately launched to find him, but all that was found was a single shell from a Rivers rifle near a small stream. Other hunters and authorities were also confused and puzzled as to what had happened to Rivers. He had been a very experienced woodsman, so it didn't make sense that somebody who knew the area and would so well would just up and vanish. But despite a very extensive search effort, there was no sign ever found. It was as if he had simply been swallowed up by the forest itself. No clues, no trace, no indication of what could have even happened to this man. The disappearance alone of Mitty remained a mystery, leaving everyone in the town of Glastonbury wondering if they would ever find out what really happened. The forested mountains that he disappeared into seemed to hold on to its secret tightly, and as of now, Mitty Rivers has never been seen again. 1946 was the year that another mysterious disappearance occurred in the forested mountains near Glastonbury. This time, it was 18-year-old Paula Weldon, a sophomore at Bennington College, who, again, vanished without a trace. On December 1st, 
After finishing her shift at the college's dining hall, Paula, who returned to her dormitory, had told her roommate that she needed to go on a walk and just get some fresh air and clear her mind. Her original plan was to actually go along with others, but she ended up being the only one to go. And so she decided to take up the popular hiking trail called Long Trail up Glastonbury Mountain, alone at around roughly 4 p.m. in the evening. And it's not like she took this trail and was just never seen again. Paula was actually seen by several other other hikers on the trail, including a man named Ernest Whitman, who she approached to and asked how far the trail went. She was also witnessed going along the trail by an elderly couple who were actually hiking about 100 yards, give or take, behind her. They claimed that they even witnessed Paula take the trail around a rocky outcropping when they rounded the same corner only moments later, she was nowhere to be seen. So when Paula failed to return to her dormitory or show up for classes the next day, she was declared missing. Authorities immediately launched a massive search effort, including offering a $5,000 reward for any information concerning her whereabouts. Even the FBI assisted in the investigation, but no trace of Paula was ever found. The disappearance of Paula Weldon was a baffling mystery that left everyone in the town wondering what happened. The trail she disappeared on was well-traveled and not particularly secluded or difficult, and Paula had been underdressed for the chilly weather even though it had been forecasted to snow heavily that evening. The strange circumstances surrounding Paula's disappearance only added to the already existing mystery surrounding the mountain area. Everybody was left wondering if she would ever be found. In 1950, the ominous force at work in the forested mountains near Glastonbury struck again, but this time it was eight-year-old Paul Jepson who vanished without a trace while playing on the farm where he lived with his mother. Now, Paul's mother had left him to play on his own while she tended her pigs on the farm. The boy had been playing happily, showing no signs of distress, but yet when his mother returned to check on him, Paul was gone. Authorities immediately converged on the area with bloodhounds to try and track the missing boy down, thinking that he would soon be located due to the fact that he had been wearing a highly visible bright red jacket. I don't know about you guys, but my missing 411 alarms are going off. No sign of Paul was ever found, and the bloodhounds trail led to a nearby highway where the scent stopped abruptly. Hundreds of volunteers gathered to scour the surrounding areas for any sign of the missing boy, but Paul Jepson was never found. The father later gave a very eerie detail that the boy had recently shown an uncharacteristically strong urge to go up the nearby mountains, almost as if they were somehow calling him into their clutches. And the disappearance of Paul Jepson added to the already existing mystery surrounding the mountains. Why did he suddenly suddenly vanished without a trace. It already seemed like this ominous force was at work claiming victim after victim, but it still doesn't stop there, folks, because on October 28th, 1950, Frida Langer, 53, and her cousin Herbert Elsner were camping with a group of friends near the Somerset Reservoir and decided to go on a hike. During the hike, Langer reportedly slipped and fell into a stream, and she told Elsner that she was not injured, but that she was soaked, and that if he waited for her there, she would change clothes clothes at the campsite and just meet up with him later. So Elsner thought nothing much of it at the time and waited as instructed. However, after over an hour had passed and Langer had yet to return, Elsner became very concerned and made his way back to the campsite to see what was going on. Langer was nowhere to be seen and none of the other campers had seen her return either. After a thorough search of the area, nothing turned up. After contacting local authorities, extensive searches were done over the next two weeks using dogs and helicopters, yet the woman, or indeed any trace of her, could not be found. The whole event was odd. It had been daytime. Langer had not been injured, and she was very familiar with the area. In a bizarre twist of fate, and very sad, the following year on May 12, 1951, Langer's decomposed body was found in full view in an open clearing near Somerset Reservoir, an area that had been extensively searched the previous year. And the body was so badly decomposed that the the ultimate cause of death could not be determined. Now, 
where did her body come from? It was as if something or someone had just dumped it there. No one knows. Langer would actually turn out to be the only missing person in the Bennington Triangle mystery whose body was ever found, and would also be the last major vanishing to be reported from there. Similar to the Alaskan Triangle and the Bermuda Triangle, there is a lot of speculation as to what and why. There seems to be something very mysterious and unsettling about this mountain. The disappearances of these individuals over a span of five years have created an eerie aura around the area, with speculation and theories running rampant. Some speculate that a serial killer could be responsible. In the large variation in age, sex, and appearance of the missing individuals, it doesn't fit with the typical, more focused taste of a serial killer. Others suggest that the victims could have fallen prey to the dangers lurking in the wilderness, such as hidden chasms, cliffs, unsteady trails, abandoned wells, which there are a lot of in this area, or wild animals, or perhaps they just got lost. However, many of the missing were actually very familiar with the area and its terrain, and extensive meticulous searches turned up absolutely nothing. And the fact that these disappearances all happened in autumn or winter does add to the mystery, as well as the strange circumstances surrounding some of the cases, like James Tedford, for example. How did he disappear in full view of a bus full of passengers? Now, some have actually suggested theories like alien abductions or attacks by Bigfoot or some other mystery monster, or that the victims themselves were swallowed up whole by some sort of interdimensional portal. In fact, not only is the entire area alive and well with reports of the supernatural, aliens, UFOs, ghosts, satanic cult activity, Bigfoots, and other various supernatural phenomena, there's even a supposed creature that lies in wait. Ever since the early 1800s, whispers of a mysterious creature had haunted the Glastonbury Mountain area. Locals dubbed this enigmatic being the Bennington Monster, and its legend grew with each passing year. The stories began with a stagecoach full of unsuspecting passengers traveling along a washed-out road. Their journey was halted abruptly when the driver driver noticed something peculiar, immense footprints in the mud, far too large to belong to any human. As passengers peered out into the darkness, a sudden terrifying attack shook the coach. A monstrous figure appeared from the shadows, its eyes gleaming with malice as it knocked the vehicle onto its side. The passengers trembled, their hearts pounding, and with a thunderous roar, the creature vanished into the depths of the forest, leaving the shaken travelers to question their own sanity along with what they had just witnessed. Later accounts would describe the Bennington monster as a towering hairy beast standing over eight feet tall and covered in black fur. The mountain's eerie reputation grew with each passing year as tales of missing persons and strange occurrences began to spread like wildfire. One such story told of a man named Carol Harris, who disappeared in 1943 while on a hunting trip not far from Glastonbury. The search for Herrick lasted three agonizing days until his lifeless body was discovered in a chilling scene. It appears as if he had been squeezed to death. His broken form had been surrounded by the same massive footprints that had been seen so long ago. The legend of the Bennington monster lived on, fueling the imaginations and fears of those who dared to venture into the shadowy realms of the Glastonbury Mountain. And though, of course, skeptics dismissed the stories as mere folklore and legend, the locals knew better, for within the depths of the wilderness, a monstrous secret lay hidden, waiting for its next unsuspecting victim. Going back to the famed Fordian author of Joseph A. Citro, he wrote a book back in 2009 called The Vermont Monster Guy, and in it, he discusses something far stranger than any Bigfoot, something even the Native Americans warned about. It reads this, No one alive has seen this dangerous anomaly on Glastonbury Mountain. Native Americans knew of it and warned people away. We can only imagine it as a sizable rock, large enough to stand on, but when someone stands upon it, the rock becomes less solid and, like a living thing, swallows the unfortunate trespasser. A number of disappearances have been reported on Glastonbury Mountain. Could all these vanished folk have stepped inadvertently on this hungry stone? There's the belief of the native people in the area that it's cursed, inhabited by demons and dark spirits, more commonly referred to as Manitou. Long ago, in the wild and mysterious lands of the Bennington area of Vermont, the Algonquin people held deep-rooted beliefs 
beliefs about the supernatural dangers that lay hidden within the shadows of the forest and mountains. They respected the land as a source of powerful energy, a place where the veil separating the physical and spiritual worlds was thin and easily pierced. To the Algonquin people, venturing into the wilderness of Bennington without proper caution was an invitation to encounter the unseen forces that dwelt within. As the crackling flames of their campfires danced beneath the night sky, the Algonquin people would share stories of spirits and shape-shifting creatures that roamed the dark forest and mountains of the region. Village elders spoke of beings known as Manitous, capable of taking various forms, sometimes as animals, other times as humanoid figures. One such tale told of the fearsome Wendigo, a cannibalistic demonic entity that was in fact a malevolent form of a Manitou. Drawn to the potent energies that coursed through the land, the Manitous wielded immense power and could actually manipulate the natural world to their will. The Algonquin elders warned of the perils that awaited those who trespassed on the sacred grounds of Bennington without proper respect or knowledge. Such individuals risked facing the wrath of these malevolent entities, falling prey to their dark intentions. Throughout the generations, stories of encounters with these supernatural beings were actually passed down, reinforcing the Algonquin's belief in the inherent danger of Bennington's wild landscapes. They shared tales of unfortunate souls who had unwittingly disturbed a Manitou's resting place and hunters who had become lost in the forest only to be driven mad by the spectral presence of these otherworldly beings. The legend of the Bennington monster, although it has evolved and taken on new interpretations over the years, remains rooted in the Algonquin people's ancient beliefs in the supernatural dangers. As the tales tell it, this eerie region has been the site of numerous unexplained disappearances, strange encounters, and inexplicable phenomena. The whispers of supernatural forces at play within the Bennington Triangle have fueled speculation that the missing 411 cases may share a similar otherworldly cause. Famed investigator and author David Politis, driven by an insatiable desire to uncover the truth has delved into the heart of these baffling vanishings, known as the missing 411 cases. Through his extensive research, Politis has uncovered a disturbing pattern of people vanishing without a trace, leaving many to wonder if something more sinister lurks beneath. Much of the stories share a haunting similarity. Individuals vanishing into thin air, despite exhaustive searches and thorough investigations, unusual weather patterns, or sudden changes in the environment at the time of the disappearance, and the baffling circumstances in which some of the missing were eventually found, either lifeless or with no memory of their harrowing ordeal. Moreover, the ancient history of the Bennington Triangle intertwined with the Algonquin people's belief in the supernatural dangers, like the malevolent Manitous, seemed to resonate with the themes present in the missing 411 cases. This connection, though speculative, has led some to entertain the possibility that the same otherworldly forces at work in the Bennington Triangle could be responsible for the unsettling disappearances chronicled by Politis. The link between the missing 411 cases, David Politis's investigations, and the unsolved mysteries of the Bennington Triangle has only deepened the intrigue surrounding these bewildering events. And while definitive answers remain elusive, the relentless pursuit of the truth serves as a stark reminder of the vast, unexplained phenomena that continue to defy our understanding and the chilling secrets that may still lie hidden within the shadows of one of the world's most remote and mysterious places. Look, the Bennington Triangle remains an unsolved mystery, and there are no clear answers to the disappearances of Mitty Rivers, Paula Weldon, James Tedford, Paul Jepson, and Frida Langer. So, what happened to these individuals? The truth remains elusive, and the woods near Glastonbury Mountain continue to remain shrouded in a foreboding sense of mystery and dread. And while we're on the topic of the East Coast, something that strikes me as very interesting is that there have been a multitude of reports about people not only seeing strange things around this area in the deep woods, but hearing things. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about Bigfoot or Dogman, I'm talking about things more on the paranormal spectrum. For example, it's been noted several times that people will hear what they describe as Native Americans chanting as if about to enter into a great war. 
perfect example is back in 2011, David and Vanessa, who had been together for well over 10 years at that point, had both loved nature and the outdoors, and they were looking forward to getting away for the weekend and traveling around the Madame Mesquite Wildlife Refuge for a time. But on their drive near the refuge, they both stopped the car because they had heard what sounded like chanting from a distance. Now, this chanting was so out of place, they actually stopped the car, rolled down the windows, and began to listen intently. They were right. It was definitely chanting, but they couldn't be sure of its origin. They both felt a chill as they stepped into a realm of spirits, so to speak. David and Vanessa believed that they had heard the legends of the Native Americans and their spiritual presence in the area, but couldn't help but feel a sense of awe at being so close to such an ancient culture. They were both shaken by what they had heard because the chanting and screaming like they had heard sounded like there was a war about to erupt. This is not the first time people have reported strange sounds and screams right around this area. It seems that when you go into a place with a lot of history, good or bad, there always seems to be an energy that encapsulates it, as if constantly reliving the past, no matter light or dark. In 1587, a second, more successful attempt at the Roanoke colony was made by a John White at the behest of Sir Walter Raleigh. Now, 115 people, including women and children, accompanied the migration. On July 22nd, the flagship of the three-vessel fleet anchored about 40 miles south of Croatoan Island, known today as Hatteras Island. Upon reaching Roanoke Island, John White found no sign of Grenville's 15 men. The fort was in shambles, the houses empty and overgrown. The only sign that anyone had been there were some bones that White discovered, presumably the remains of one of the victims. Now, three days later, the entire group of colonists disembarked, reclaiming the structures as best they could to start their new lives. Difficulties with the indigenous population restarted at once. And shortly thereafter, one of the island's inhabitants killed a man foraging for crabs by the waterside. Now, White was able to negotiate a truce with the local Croatan tribe, aided by Manteo, a member of the tribe who had been friendly to previous colonists, even traveling to England on several occasions. Manteo told White that most of the violence had been perpetuated by a coalition of tribes from the mainland, led by the ruler Wanchesi. The colonists attempted a peace deal using the Croatan tribe as an intermediary, but were met with silence. Now, fearing for the safety of his people, John White led a preemptive strike against one of the enemy villages, but unknown to them, Wanchesi had already withdrawn his own people. Instead, the colonists ended up killing their own allies and their Croatan who were in the process of looting the settlement. Now, relations were strained between the English and both tribes. Thankfully for them, Manteo smoothed things over. I mean, boy, wouldn't you have loved to be a fly on the wall for that conversation? There was a glimmer of hope amidst all this fighting. For you see, on August 18th, 1587, Virginia Dare was born, widely regarded as the first European born in the New World. Her last name was later given to the North Carolina County, where Roanoke Island sits. Now, despite this positive development, the colonists determined that they would be better served moved 50 miles north. They wanted White to return to England and bring back a shipment of supplies for this venture. White agreed, and little did he know that this was the last he would ever see of anyone in Roanoke Colony. White's quick trip to England was delayed, although he arrived on November 5th after a difficult journey. He found his country in turmoil, at war with Spain. Reports indicated that the Spanish Armada was mobilizing for attack, and Queen Elizabeth had decreed that no vessel should leave London as every ship would be needed to participate in the impending battle. After many appeals, White was allowed to return, and Sir Richard Grenville, involved in the Roanoke Colony saga earlier, obtained a waiver to attack the Spanish in the Caribbean, or Caribbean, however you want to say it, and White was permitted to accompany him in March of 1588. 
However, unfavorable conditions kept the fleet in England, where new orders were handed down instructing Grenville to remain available for combat at the home front. Luckily, White was permitted to take two of the ships, one less fit for combat, back to America on April 22nd. The misfortunes refused to let up, however. The captains kept trying to capture Spanish ships to beef up their payday. Now, following these delays, around 24 members of the crew were attacked and killed by French pirates near Morocco, forcing the two ships to return to England. Finally, the Spanish Armada was defeated in August of 1588. However, the Queen's travel ban remained in place to prepare for a counterattack. John White would not be allowed to return to Roanoke Colony until 1590, two years after he had promised to return with supplies. The colonists learned a valuable lesson. There are two things you should never wait for, John White and the next George R. R. Martin book. That summer, White secured permission to travel aboard a privateering expedition into the Caribbean. Two of the six ships were permitted to break off from the fleet to take White back to Roanoke. On August 12th, the Hopewell and the Moonlight reached Croatoan Island. Three days later, smoke was sighted both from the north and south ends of Roanoke. Tides, weather, and some of which claimed the lives of crew members prevented a successful crossing of Pamlico Sound until the night of August 17th. Now, although the crew had seen more smoke, no one wanted to venture into the woods after dark. Instead, the rescuers overnighted just offshore in their boats, loudly singing songs in English in the hope that their voices would reach the stranded colonist. Now, the following morning, John White and his companions finally set foot once more on Roanoke Island. It would not prove to be a happy homecoming. Fresh footprints were found in the sandy soil, but... Their calls to the owners were answered only with the incessant buzzing of insects. None of the colony's boats could be seen on the shoreline. The houses were not only abandoned, they were fully dismantled. Any items that could have been carried had been removed. A handful of large trunks, including three buried by white, had all been exhumed and looted. But the most confounding details of all could be found in two locations— the first was a tree into which someone had carved the letters C-R-O. The second was a palisade erected to fortify the settlement in the time since White had left. On one of the posts was carved the name Croatoan. White had left the colonist with instructions. Before leaving Roanoke Island to resettle elsewhere, they were to leave behind what they referred to as a secret token, indicating their destination. In the event that they were forced out of the colony, the survivors were told to leave behind a different pattern, one signifying duress. This led White to believe that his people had fled under peaceful circumstances to the south towards Croatoan Island. White wanted to follow up on this lead immediately. However, in the meantime, one of the Hopewell's anchor cables had broken, leaving the ship vulnerable to wrecking should a storm arise. Now, the search efforts were called off, although White was granted a compromise. He planned to winter with the Hopewell in the Caribbean and return to investigate Croatoan Island in spring of 1591. Like so many other attempts to investigate, this too met with failure. After embarking on her journey to the Caribbean, the Hopewell was blown off course, forcing a supply stop in the Azores. Weather prevented landfall there as well, so the ship returned to England on October 24, 1590. Now, in the years since, Roanoke Colony, or the Lost Colony as it became known, has perplexed historians and the public alike. While at first, the possibility of relocation seems likely. I mean, no survivors were ever found, and some think that they were wiped out by the indigenous population. But if so... Why did they carve a location and not their duress signal? Would they have even had time to carve anything at all if they were being attacked? The most popular theory holds that the colonists integrated with the friendlier tribes. In fact, today's Roanoke Hatteras tribe claims that their lineage includes both the native Croatan tribe and the lost colonists themselves. 
Other ideas include a Spanish attack, a failed return trip to England, a deliberate attempt by Sir Walter Raleigh's rivals to maroon the colonists, or that the colonists simply wandered into the wilderness where they perished. It has also been claimed that another tree to the south on Hatteras Island bore the inscription Cora, or C-O-R-A, suggesting another final destination. Somewhere on the mainland near Lake Matamasquit, where the small core tribe dwelled. Perhaps the colonists left a trail of breadcrumbs for John White to follow, a trail now lost to time. In any case, a definitive answer still eludes us. We may never know what truly happened to the lost colony, but equally confounding mysteries abound all across the Outer Banks and the coast of North Carolina. The name Lookout Mountain appears on maps as early as 1795. Even before then, the mountain bore witness to every major confrontation to touch Tennessee, from Revolutionary War skirmishes to the famed Last Battle of the Cherokees in the 1700s. Now, in 1863, it saw the Battle of Lookout Mountain unfold on its slopes as part of the American Civil War. Prior to the arrival of settlers, Lookout Mountain still held a special place among the indigenous population. The Chickamauga tribe, a branch of the Cherokee, had named the summit Chattanooga, lending the modern town its name. While archaeologists speculate that the mountain once supported Native American settlements, little physical evidence has been found to support this possibility. That being said, the placement of boulders strewn all along the mountain slopes sometimes evokes images of walls or lanes once erected by human hands long, long ago. Now today, Lookout Mountain remains a popular tourist destination from its summit. I mean, you can see seven states, Tennessee, of course, but also Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, and on clear days, Virginia and Kentucky. Palatial houses litter the mountainside, allowing easy access to such attractions as a golf course, an incline railway, Point Park Battlefield, and of course, Ruby Falls. Lookout Mountain's most famous tourist destination might well be Rock City, a collection of impressive boulders which form labyrinthine passageways crisscrossing the slopes. But amidst all these distractions, a darker current lingers in and around Lookout Mountain, one which few tourists notice until they bump into it firsthand. The mountain, as well as the surrounding vicinity, have become a playground for spirits, if many of the legends and campfire tales are to be believed. Perhaps the most terrifying of all, Chattanooga has a Sabaro pizza. Immediately to the northwest edge of Lookout Mountain sits Georgia's Cloudland Canyon State Park near the towns of Trenton and Cooper Heights. Visitors to Cloudland find themselves amidst a rugged landscape, with the central focal point of a deep gorge carved over millions of years, known as Sitton Gulch. It is one of the largest parks in Georgia and is often regarded as one of the most scenic as well. However, getting into Cloudland Canyon State Park can be a precarious proposition. The primary route is a two-lane highway filled with treacherous switchbacks, meaning that the slightest distraction can result in catastrophe. In the 84 years since the park's opening, many automobiles have tumbled to the bottom of the canyon, both by accident and on purpose, as it was once used as a dumping ground for a band of truck thieves. Now, over the years, numerous stories have floated up around Cloudland Canyon State Park, clinging to the slopes like an early morning fog. Ever since it opened, people have seen the spirits of the land's original inhabitants, who once used Sitton Gulch as a hunting ground. One of the most persistent ghosts is that of a Native American warrior, who is said to patrol Cloudland Canyon State Park astride his horse. Whether he is haunting the area or protecting it is anyone's guess. The warrior's ghost is said to have been first reported by campers. The spirit, sitting atop his horse, stood stoically on a rocky cliff high above the campers, clearly visible in the fading light of sunset. There, the rider and his mount remained, looking over Sitton Gulch as darkness fell before fading into the night. 
Similar reports have persisted over the years, always with the warrior watching his homeland in silence. Some actually make their way up to the rocky outcropping once daylight breaks and always report the same thing, the clear tracks of a shoeless horse. However, it is impossible to tell where the horse entered or exited. The tracks are always confined to one small area as if it simply materialized and then dematerialized on the spot. Similar hoof prints were noted around a campsite sometime in the early 2000s. In the middle of the night, campers heard the unmistakable sound of a horse and rider encircling their tents, but they were too afraid to take a look. After dawn, they emerged from the safety of their shelters only to find a series of tracks that never seemed to enter or leave their campsite. Could it be possible that somewhere in the deepest recesses of some unknown jungle wilderness in the Congo, plants of sufficient size feast upon even larger prey, even human beings? Imagine saving up all of your money for that one trip you always have wanted to take. Maybe you live in the US and finally have a chance to visit Europe. Maybe vice versa. Maybe your tastes are far more exotic and you wish to see the natural wonders of our very world. The wild places which human beings have yet to tame where adventure seems to lurk around every corner. Maybe you find yourself in an isolated jungle. You go deep into the forest, wondering with each step whether or not anybody else has ever set foot where you are at this instant. It's an exciting prospect, but inevitably, you will have to use the bathroom. You might have a tour guide and seeking some privacy, step off the trail, still with an earshot, but breaking the line of sight so you can do your business. You find a nice patch of clear ground amidst the vines and leaf litter as a good place as any, and you drop trow, settle in, and try to relax so you can get on with your tour. You're about halfway done when you notice something moving. It's curling up by your foot, long and serpentine. Your first instinct is to freeze. It looks like a snake has made its home here, and then you take a closer look and realize it's not that bad. No, it's much, much worse. Whatever this is, it's too long to be a snake. Now, still frozen, your eyes trace the length of this intruder, quickly finding the tail end before reversing in search of the head. You look and look, daring to turn your head ever so slowly, following the curves up to where they end. This is not a snake. It is a vine, and it is attached to a tree, and it is moving ever so slightly right there before your very eyes. And in moments, the vine whips around your ankle, tightening like a noose, and you're dragged pantsless off your feet and through the heavy cover of dead leaves. And before you know it, you feel the ground fall away behind you, leaving you suspended upside down in midair. You might cry for help, but you've wandered too far. It's too late. And before you, what you thought was once a tree trunk was now split down the middle, revealing a pink maw of jagged thorns as long as your forearm. The vine drags you ever closer, affording a glimpse inside your final resting place. Your last moments will be shared alongside the remains of other victims, the bones of monkeys, deer, even a human skull. The last thing you remember is being wrapped in the cold embrace of the tree trunk, the thorns piercing deep into you. The green of the jungle fades into darkness. You try to batter the interior walls of your newfound prison, but it is useless. You have just fallen victim to a man-eating plant. Sure, it sounds like utter science fiction, but there are some indications such a life form might actually exist on planet Earth. I mean, after all, we all are well acquainted with actual carnivorous plants, from Venus flycatchers to pitcher plants, which eat everything from insects to smaller vertebrates like amphibians. Man-eating plants have fascinated our imagination for over a hundred years. These horrifying monstrosities have appeared in the pages of writers like H.G. Wells, have taken to the stage in the musical Little Shop of Horrors, and even graced our screens in the Harry Potter franchise. In Japan, 
There was once a belief in Juboko, or Tree Child, a type of yokai spirit that took the form of a tree on a battlefield, drawing strength from the blood that soaked into the earth. Having developed a taste for human fluids, it continued to sustain itself by using its limbs to snag any unsuspecting bystanders, penetrating their flesh with a tube-like protrusion to drain their blood. Now, afterwards, the juboko appeared like any other natural tree, although when it was cut, it leaked not sap, but human blood. And the fact of the matter is, we are fascinated by the possibility of predation from the plant kingdom, a deep-seated fear which refuses to go away. Something about the very concept seems so very, very plausible. Now, in the Western scientific discourse, the origins of these fictional stories can be traced back well into the 19th century. Perhaps the most famous man-eating plant appeared in James Williams Buell's 1887 book titled Sea and Land, an illustrated history of the wonderful and curious things of nature existing before and since the deluge. Sweet Christmas, that's a long title. Now, Buell's book, which is presented as a sober, rational work of nonfiction, has fueled more than a century of speculation. I mean, he mentions a species of plant known to grow throughout Central and South America with related specimen found in Africa along the coastline of the Indian Ocean. Buell wrote this, Travelers have told us of a plant which they assert grows in Central Africa and also in South America that is not contented with the myriad of large insects which it catches and consumes, but its veracity extends to making even humans its prey. It has a short, thick trunk, from the top of which radiate giant spines, narrow and flexible, but of extraordinary tenaciousness, and the edges of which are armed with barbs or dagger-like teeth. Instead of growing upright or at an inclined angle from the trunk, these spines lay their outer ends upon the ground, and so gracefully are they distributed that the trunk resembles an easy couch with green drapery around it. The unfortunate traveler, ignorant of the monstrous creation which lies in his way, and curious to examine the strange plant, or rest himself upon its inviting stalk, approaches without a suspicion of his certain doom. The moment his feet are set within the circle of the horrid spines, they rise up like gigantic serpents and entwine themselves about him until he is drawn upon the stump, when they speedily drive their daggers into his body, thus completing the massacre. The body is crushed until every drop of blood is squeezed out of it and becomes absorbed by the gore-loving plant. When the dry carcass is thrown out and the horrid trap is set again. Buell went on to claim that not only were these man-eating plants known to the indigenous populations, but that they had been witnessed by European explorers as well. And he tells the story of a gentleman whom he knew who lived in Central America for a number of years and had seen man-eating plants firsthand. According to this informant, the Central American man-eating plant does not leave its spines or vines limp, but instead sends them wildly flailing about in the air. Like so many huge serpents in an angry discussion, occasionally darting from side to side, as if striking at an imaginary foe. Whenever its unwitting prey crosses into the path of one of these appendages, the victim is grasped in an unbreakable embrace. The limb closes around its new meal, embedding spines into the victim's body from all directions. Buell compared this method of constriction to the medieval torture device known as the Iron Maiden, a large coffin-like metal cabinet whose interior is lined with spikes. Now, Buell continued with a secondary story from another acquaintance, this time a learned scholar from Colombia, a Dr. Antonio José Márquez, a distinguished gentleman of the city of Barranquilla. In describing this wonderful plant to the author, affirms that when excited, it violently agitates its long, tentacle-like stems, the edges of which, rasping around upon each other, produce a hissing noise which resembles the Spanish expression, Yata veo, the literal translation of which is, I see you. 
The plant is therefore known in South America by the name Yataveo. He further asserts that so poisonous are the stems that if the flesh of any animal be punctured by the sharp barbs, a rapidly eating ulcer immediately forms, for which there is no known antidote, and death speedily ensues. Now, Buell closes the passage with a confession of skepticism, writing that, I'm not inclined to doubt, not that there is no foundation for such statements as travelers sometimes make about this astonishing growth, but that the facts are greatly exaggerated. Buell's work suggests that the South American Yataveo may be the same, or at least related to, another carnivorous plant allegedly found in Africa. He alluded to one explorer who, while traveling the continent, watched a plant completely devour a native indigenous man. Buell claimed to have heard similar stories from the Fan or Fang people and modern Gaboon, Cameroon, and Equatorial Guinea. According to Buell, these people supposedly executed criminals and those convicted of practicing witchcraft by throwing them into the arms of a massive carnivorous flora. Rumors of man-eating plants are most common in Madagascar. In fact, he claimed that a carnivorous tree had been recently discovered in Mexico on the edge of the Sierra Madre. The specimen sported slimy snake-like appendages, which it primarily used to capture and consume birds, evidenced by the bones and feathers which littered the ground around it. Seems like a logical conclusion after all. Supposedly, it was even observed taking offerings of chickens from locals, though it seemed to latch on to whatever was present. In one instance, Dr. Wilson claimed a man's hand came in contact with the tendrils. He was only able to break free after a significant struggle that tore flesh from his very hand. Another tree is allegedly not a man-eater per se, but nonetheless possesses an unprecedented ability to kill from a distance. If the legends surrounding it are to be believed, unlike other plants we have discussed, Antiaris toxicaria verifiably exist as part of the mulberry and fig family. It is remarkably widespread, its range stretching from Africa to Australia, Asia, and various tropical islands from Tonga to the Philippines to Indonesia. Antiaris is used both for hardwood and for food, its limbs producing an edible seed. However, latex from the tree the milky fluid produced whenever it is tapped is shockingly toxic. Among island Southeast Asian cultures, it is employed to enhance the destructive power of ranged weapons like arrows and blow darts. In fact, in China, Antiaris earned the reputation of 7-up, 8-down, 9-dead. Anyone inflicted with the poison will die after taking 7 steps uphill, 8 steps downhill, or 9 steps on level ground. Interestingly, in China, the phrase one up, one down, one death applies to Sabaro Pizza. With this lethal reputation came legends that Antiaris was capable of killing at a distance without any physical contact. In fact, a surgeon's account dated 1783 claimed that the Antiaris was capable of killing all animal life in a surrounding 15 miles radius. It was said that the Indonesians would send only the most vile criminals to collect latex from anti-Aris trees near Mount Batur, with only two out of every 20 people sent ever returning alive. Those are pretty grim numbers. In reality, these deaths were attributable to toxic fumes from a dormant volcano at Mount Batur, named Guava Upas. This led to an alternative name for anti-Aris, the Upas tree. In fact, James William Buell wrote about the Antiaris as the Upas tree in his book, Sea and Land, mere pages before describing carnivorous trees. He readily admitted how harmless the tree was as long as the latex was avoided. Regardless of whether or not man-eating trees truly exist or trees that can kill at a distance, we have plenty of actual carnivorous plants that we know for a fact exist all use traps to lure insects and sometimes small vertebrates into their clutches. Now, where they become trapped and their nutrients slowly digested. 
Examples include pitcher plants, cobra lilies, butterworts, monkey cups, sundews, and bladderworts. Sounds like a potion list from Hogwarts. Now, some of these carnivorous plants even exhibit mysteries all of their own. The Venus flytrap is probably the most famous carnivorous plant, its trapping structure and trigger hairs resembling a wide open mouth lined with teeth. Venus flytraps grow exclusively in the coastal regions of North and South Carolina in the United States and are so unlike anything else found on Earth that some people once speculated that they originated on another planet altogether. While few people seriously entertain this idea today, the Venus flytrap was once rumored to be a refugee from outer space, perhaps traveling to Earth on a meteorite. It is an absurd notion, but consider this. The natural range of the Venus flytrap just so happens to coincide with a series of circular depressions along the east coast of the United States known as the Carolina Bays. Now, these landmarks have long puzzled scientists who have yet to find a reason for their existence. One set of researchers, including geomythologist Randall Carson, speculate that the Carolina Bays were created by extraterrestrial impacts. In other words, meteorites. Could the same debris from outer space have not only caused the Carolina Bays, but also brought spores of extraterrestrial botanical life to our own planet? Plant life that we now call the Venus flytrap. There are other reasons to consider the Venus flytraps otherworldly. It takes a few seconds for each cell to relax, which means that it would take about two minutes for the plant to close. This doesn't seem like a good candidate for a mechanism that takes less than a second. Venus flytraps also respond to anesthesia. In 2017, researchers placed a flytrap in a container filled with ether and after a full hour passed, tried stimulating the plant's trigger hairs. It did not respond. On paper, this should not work. Yet anesthesia has demonstrated a notable effect on plants, gosh, since the mid 19th century. Such a reaction, or lack thereof, in Venus flytraps has profound implications for the way we conceptualize consciousness. Discoveries of more carnivorous plants may yet to be on the horizon, and they might be right underneath our noses. In South America, a large spiny plant known as Puya chilensis grows along the hillsides in Chile. Most botanists believe that these spines evolved to prevent predators from reaching the edible center of the plant. However, shepherds in Chile avoid Puya chilensis because they believe it represents a threat to their flocks. In fact, the shepherds often refer to it as the sheep-eating plant and believe that its spikes serve as an offensive purpose as well. They swear that these spikes regularly impale and trap birds and other animals, including their own sheep, leaving them to starve and die on the ground below. This, and the shepherd's claim, allows Puya chilensis to absorb the nutrients offered by decaying corpses and cadavers as they filter into the soil above its roots. The perceived threat posed by the plant is so strong that shepherds will actively burn wide swaths of pasture just to protect their flocks from its spiny barbs. And notably, this has never been documented, although the possibility is gaining traction among scientists and botanists alike. Alex Henderson, caretaker of Canada's Royal Botanical Gardens, is actually one of them. Henderson said that the ability for Puya chilensis to ensnare animals is noted in a couple of very, very renowned scientific texts. I was actually working with the plant the other day and I nearly cut my hand open on it. So I can imagine if you got caught in that, you would never, ever get out again. If not a fully carnivorous plant, the sheep-eating plant may be offering us a rare treat, a glimpse into the evolutionary process itself. Henderson went on to add, it's actually classified as potentially a proto-carnivorous plant, which essentially means that through this plant's evolutionary path, it might be evolving towards carnivory. Notably, Puya chilensis is much larger than other carnivorous plants we have documented, suggesting that the legends of a fully carnivorous tree may one day come true. I mean, who knows? Maybe some time in the not-so-distant future with how world events are planning out, 
we'll wander across post-elliptic fallout-esque landscapes where we'll have another threat to add to the list of diseases, warfare, and nuclear fallout. Gigantic carnivorous plants patiently waiting for a meal to come by their way. Now, in my opinion, with all the things we've discovered on this planet, I mean, it seems possible and probable that a man-eating tree exists in the far reaches of the Congo jungles or even on Madagascar. I mean, after all, there are many tribes we have never come across, places man has not quite visited. I mean, hell, in the Amazon alone, there are tribes we don't even know about who have never made contact with us white European men. But for my sanity and mental well-being, I would like to just say that they probably don't exist because it makes me feel a lot better. When David was much younger, he lived in Lancaster, California. He spent some time with his girlfriend out at the Dunes on Avenue K and 150th Street East. They were waiting for some friends to meet them, but they never showed up. So, around midnight, they decided to head home, and on this particular night, it was very dark. And they had heard dogs barking all night, but since the area was filled with coyotes, they didn't think much of it. Now, as they approached the intersection of Avenue K and 150th, David noticed something move against the night sky. And as soon as he saw it, whatever it was turned its head to look at his car. And he knows this because of the eye shine against his headlights. It continued to stare at his car as it crossed the road. They then made the turn westbound on Avenue K, whatever it had been threw him into temporary shock, so much so that when he looked down at the speedometer, he was going 145 miles an hour. He immediately slows down, asks his girlfriend if she had seen what he had seen, and she could only nod her head yes. He dropped her off at her house and drove home. Now, upon arriving, he promptly called the sheriff's department. So, as to not sound like a crazy person right off the bat, David simply asked if a disturbance had been reported in the area of 150th Street East and Avenue K. The deputy asked him for more details about what kind of disturbance this had been and David didn't really know how to describe it. The deputy was becoming a bit annoyed at his evasiveness and finally asked, what exactly are you asking about? David took a deep breath and began telling the deputy that he wasn't going to believe him and then describe exactly what he had seen. Now, without missing a beat, the deputy said, you know, it could have been Bigfoot. Now, at first, David thought he was patronizing him. However, the deputy followed up with, no, really, we've had reports of Bigfoot in the area, and with the drought, everything is coming down out of the mountains. Now, this morning, they just pulled a 400-pound black bear off the 14 freeway. The deputy thanked David for the call, and they hung up. Could it be that the people of this town have accepted that they have Bigfoot roaming nearby? This next story comes from Jameson, who was hesitant to send the story in, but my recent mermaid videos have inspired him to share it with all of us. Now, this encounter occurred during the summer when he was about four or five years old. It took place in Sylvan Beach, New York. It was a typical hot summer day, and Jameson was enjoying some time at the beach with his mother and sister. Now, the beach swimming area was crowded, and people were sunbathing and relaxing under umbrellas. It was a seemingly ordinary day and what you'd expect for a day at the beach. But Jameson was swimming or playing in the shallow waters close to the shore when he heard his mother call to him from afar in the deeper water. Now, for some reason, he got terrified to swim out to her, which was weird because he was a good swimmer and had not had any accidents thus far. However, something on this day was telling him that there would be trouble if he went out there, his gut instinct firing off. He also knew that if he did not do as his mother said, that would not end well. So he came up with the idea of holding onto the rope. There was a roped off area that was supposed to be dangerous to swim in for some reason. And he started by using the rope to go out to her, but knew that eventually the point would come where he would need to let go and swim to her as she wasn't close to the rope. 
Now, he wasn't gliding on the rope very far before he felt like two hands had grabbed his legs. Now, he starts to fight and try to keep his head above the water, but something told him not to look down at whatever it was. Instead, he looked at the sky and fought to get away. Now, he did his best to hold on to the rope and keep trying to kick his feet to free his own escape, and he lost the rope quickly, but tried to use his hands to help him escape. Now, suddenly, whatever was hanging onto his ankles just let go. Unfortunately, by this time, he was already underwater and now sinking rapidly. Just when he thought he wasn't going to make it, he saw a face above him, above the water, looking down at him. The person who appeared out of nowhere, or so it seemed, pulled him up out of the water. He thought it was an adult, but was later told it was actually a teenager. He was also later told that he had gotten caught in hay. He thought this unlikely as hay or bales of hay don't have hands to grab you and pull you down. Now, it's easy to dismiss Jameson's encounter because it could be easily perceived that a four or five year old would, of course, not understand the difference, but I think there's more to this. Now, at one point, he was also told it was seaweed and he knew better. It felt like hands and he could feel the force of being dragged down. He can remember everything, including the desperation he felt while staring up at the sky and fighting with everything he had to make it out of the water where he would be able to breathe. Now, predictably, when he was carried ashore, people swarmed. He doesn't remember if there were any marks or scratches on his hands or feet, and no one took him seriously, of course, when he tried to explain that something had grabbed him. But what do you think, though? Is this the overactive imagination of a child who never even participated in an imaginative play, a child confused after nearly dying, a misunderstanding of what was happening when it was just seaweed or hay? Something supernatural, a dangerous prank where no one saw the prankster, or something else. Well, whatever it was that nearly caused him to drown, one thing is true. While he did not get the teen's name, he is sure glad he was there that day. Now, thinking back, he doesn't know how he was able to grab him in time, especially from as far away as it was. It should have been impossible. Now, we're going to go on to talk about some of Jared's experiences. The supernatural seems to follow Jared nearly everywhere he goes. The first incident happened on Christmas Eve 1994. Jared was 12 years old when he had heard children talking outside, and he thought, how nice is it to hear kids talking and enjoying Christmas Eve? But shouldn't children be waiting for Santa at this hour? He decides to walk outside to take a look, but nobody was there, and there was no footprints anywhere in the snow. So he shrugs it off, and for a few years, he just felt odd about it. Now. It wasn't until March of 98 that things began getting weird. I'm talking Portland weird. He was sitting on the couch watching Married with Children at 11.30 p.m. and everything was fairly normal. All of his family was asleep, including his sister who was sleeping in her room and all of the pets were asleep. Now suddenly, Jared hears this maniacal laughter <laughs> pouring out from his sister's slightly ajar bedroom door. At first, he thought he was crazy, but then it happened again, and again, it trails off. He jumps off the couch, goes into the kitchen, and grabs two knives. He finally made his way to the parents' bedroom, where he wakes up his father, but his father was simply annoyed. So, Jared was told to go to bed. However, from that point on, strange things wouldn't stop happening. TVs would turn on and off. Things could be heard moving and shuffling around and faucets turning off and on by themselves. The subsequent two serious incident happened in 2000 and 2002. The most significant one occurred when five people were present. Jared, his sister, and a few friends had decided to go out and buy a large assortment of balloons to fill up his bedroom. There were so many that when they sat down on the floor, they were wholly engulfed in balloons. This was the intended result. 
Now, the group began flailing their arms, making balloons fly everywhere. They were getting pretty loud, and being awakened was something that upset his parents tremendously. Not caring about this at the time, they continued making noise, when all of a sudden, they all heard someone whisper, SHUT UP! inside of their minds as if it were their own consciousness. The best way Jared can describe it is that it sounded like it was being said in a static, metallic tone. Everyone froze, and they all stared at one another, confused and also frightened by what had happened. A feeling of dread swept over the entire room. Everyone felt petrified just by the feeling alone at that moment that they all left. As frightening as it was, it was great to finally have three other people experience some strange things that had been happening. The group could not get over that. They had all heard the same creepy whisper over all of the yelling. The next day, Jared asked his parents if they had been awakened, and they said they had not heard a peep. Now, Jared's next story takes place when he was called to pick up his father when he broke down at work on his mail route. Now that day, the house seemed to have a silent but cold feeling all day, and he was happy to leave. After walking outside, he turns around to return to the house to get something. But when he did, the feeling inside the house had changed for the worse. Immediately, he felt like he should leave. However, he didn't and instead continued down the hallway. And as he walked down the hallway toward a closet, the closet door blew open and clothes went flying across the hall. He ran like hell back out the front door. Another otherworldly event happened to Jared on a night he stayed over at a friend's place. When he arrived back home around six in the morning, his dad was pissed. And when Jared asks him why he is mad, his dad says, and I quote, that damn ghost attacked your sister last night and you should have been here. Jared asked his sister what had happened and this is what she said. She was talking on the phone and began to feel the dread building up. So she wanted to get into the room and close the door, but she had to get ready for bed first. And as she was doing this, a stack of folded laundry was sitting neatly on a chair and she could see the chair from the bathroom. Now suddenly, she noticed movement and watched the entire stack of towels fell off the chair. Perturbed but not yet fearful, she proceeded to restack the laundry and then continued getting ready for bed. Now apparently this ghost must hate clean laundry or must be a messy person. The dread intensified and she watched as more towels fell, but this time with more than enough force to move them a short distance away from the chair. The dread was now intensifying and at the same time, something started pounding on her door so hard she thought it was going to break down. She began screaming and crying in terror. Now this woke her parents up. They would later share that they too heard the commotion. Now another night, not too long after Jared's sister was in her bedroom while he and a friend were watching TV in the den, as they call it, as they were sitting there, Jared begins to hear an odd sound. Then the dread feeling returns. When he investigates more closely, he sees that the sound he just heard was the amp turning itself on, followed by the five disc CD changer, which also turned itself on. It didn't just come on, it also started changing and cycling through the discs. It got to the third disc, started clicking through the tracks, and then started playing I Can't Get No Satisfaction by the Rolling Stones. His dad didn't believe that he hadn't done it. Jared moved out shortly after that. Now, Jared can tie many of his experiences back to electricity. Here's one such story. His front porch typically had two lights, but one of them had burned out at one point, and it was not storming that day, but suddenly, what looked like lightning flashed with a boom, and after it happened, something looked different. Upon examination, Jared heard a weird click and saw that the broken light on the porch had come on all on its own. The light that had burnt out was now shining brightly and the other bulb was out. This could have been a fluke, but the fact that there were no thunderheads, the switch flipped and the burnout light was revived is all strange. Now, Jared's next experience took place on July 24th, 2000. 
He has spent years trying to uncover more information about what he experienced, and over the years, he has discovered that what he witnessed has been going on since at least 1923 in his neighborhood. It was some sort of craft hovering above him. Now, in 1987, the same, or at least similar craft, almost landed on one of the most prominent highways in Pennsylvania, Route 30, which these crafts seem to follow. Now, this road runs right through Chestnut Ridge, which is where he thinks they regularly travel. On this particular evening, he was stargazing, being out in the middle of nowhere. Now, he usually didn't sit out there alone, and tonight was no different. As the group was just standing there, chatting about life or whatever it is they talk about, they suddenly heard this deafening, continuous boom coming from the sky to the west. There was nothing to the west. Above their heads was a 200-foot-long craft that was low enough that you could easily hit it with a rifle. It was just hovering in silence over their heads. The guy with him then says, Are we really seeing that? And Jared thought, so that's what it is. Now, before this evening, he had seen this thing at least 10 times flying extremely high into the blue until it disappeared. He thought it was a blimp and was impressed that they had made a blimp that could handle those air pressures and altitudes. This night, however, confirmed that it wasn't a blimp. It was a cigar-shaped craft, a craft size and shape commonly seen by many other UFO sightings, with three red lights pulsating slowly on each side. He ran to get a camera, but this was 2000. They only had a 1989 camcorder that needed to be plugged into operate. Instead, he grabbed some binoculars because he wanted to see this thing, and as he continued to watch this, the sound kept getting louder, and he could now see five Harrier-type jets in a V formation following it. The weirdest part was they seemed like they were moving in slow motion, but they couldn't have been, as their afterburners were all on. Now, the following day, he found himself up early. After all, it was hard to sleep after seeing something like that. A friend of his had stayed over after what they had witnessed the night before. That's a good friend. Since they were both up early, Jer drove his friend home, and as his friend was getting out of the car, he said, We really saw that last night, didn't we? Jared was still so dumbfounded and shocked by the entire experience, he doesn't recall his response. He does, however, remember that immediately upon returning home, he jumped online to look for any information regarding what he had seen. He is convinced that it was a secret government craft. I mean, why else would five jets be following it? The next experience Jared shared took place one night in August of 1998. A neighborhood friend of his came to his window in the middle of the night, knocked on it, and asked if he could come out and just chat with him as he was going through a really rough breakup. Jared agreed to talk to him, and they laid in the driveway and looked up at the stars as they chatted. How romantic. The night was clear, and as Jared was looking at the stars, he saw that two of them appeared to be moving. Then he realized they were not just moving, but they were doing figure eights over and over again. Jared turned to his friend and said, Are you seeing that too? His friend replied that he also saw it. His friend, however, was too distraught over his personal life issues that they didn't really stop to talk about what they had seen. Jared can't stop thinking about what he had witnessed and decides that they should plan to do it again on the next full moon in August. Now, on the day they had chosen to watch the sky, Jared was at work when something strange happened. He was working as a farmhand and was on the way to one of the fields when he noticed this lovely little waterfall in a pasture. There was only one road to this field, so he was pretty sure it would be easy to find if he decided to return. Another one of their friends dropped the two guys off nearby. They planned to repeat the other evening. However, as they start down the road, they cannot find the waterfall anywhere. They were never able to locate it, and Jared was so bothered by this that he later went back in the daytime to see where it was. He never found it and was never able to explain why. On another evening, Jared and a friend were walking around a nearby field in the darkness. No flashlights, no phones, nothing. And suddenly, they saw these huge shadows coming towards them. Massive shadows. They were the size of Clydesdales. 
the young man ran out of the field and headed back toward his parents' house. Now, as they walked past the only house in the road, they heard what sounded like a woman crying for help, and it was really loud. They couldn't see her in any window, but continued to look around and see if she needed help. She continued to cry and beg for help, but when they could not locate her, they figured they should seek help. Now, they crossed the intersections and started up a hill. That road only had two trees and apparently a dog somewhere because they kept hearing it bark. Now, the, when the woman stopped crying for help, they began to hear a car's engine but could see no headlights anywhere. Then, on this winding road, they saw a car with no headlights come creeping down the hill extremely slowly. This car didn't have brake lights either. The car reached the stop sign at the intersection and four people got out of the car. They appeared to be dressed in black suits and began searching around the vehicle. Jared assumed they were looking for him and his friend, so he told his friend to hug a tree. When you hug a tree, it is tough for someone to see you in the darkness. Jared and his friend go undetected, and after about two minutes, the four individuals return to the car. They again begin their trek up the hill just as the car returns from a different direction. The car stops the intersection again, and four people get out. Again, Jared and his friend hide, and after about a minute, the same four get back into the car. At this point, Jared and his friend agree that they need to get home and fast. They decided not to mention the woman crying as they believed her to be otherworldly. Jared's next experience occurred at his ex-wife's parents' house. At some point in the middle of the night, when he could not sleep, he got on the floor to do some push-ups and sit-ups. Because the only light was from his fish tank, he pulls out his phone for a little extra light. And as he did this, he begins to feel dread. When he looked at the phone screen, it dialed eight zeros and hit send on its own. What he heard next coming from the phone's speaker was static and screaming. Screaming so loud that it sounded like people were burning alive. He throws the phone across the room and lays awake for the remainder of the night, waiting for the sun to come up. Jared faced something else he could not explain while he was visiting a childhood friend. The friend had just recently bought a home and had moved back to town. Now, this home he had purchased is an old home, built in 1795 and had just recently been remodeled. Now, as Jared was touring the house with his friend and girlfriend, he felt the most intense dread when they reached the staircase. Jared turns to his friend and says, does anything weird ever happen in this house? Immediately, his friend's girlfriend's response, see, he feels it too. Now, nothing more happened that day, but something strange happened one evening in January of 2018. The three of them were visiting when they heard these three huge sounds. It was boom, boom, boom. Jared initially thought it was the furnace. His friend's girlfriend speaks up and says, that hasn't happened in a while. As they all sat there, they suddenly heard it again. Boom, boom, boom. His friends tried to act like the sound was typical and said something like, huh, must have been a truck that passed. Jared remained motionless and terrified over the next few seconds, and the following occurred. Gallons of water began pouring from the ceiling fan. Carry-on beetles started coming out of the ceiling fan. The booms continued in sets of three, sometimes so violently so that things fell off the shelves. The blinds began to aggressively sway, swinging back and forth. No windows were open and a Mountain Dew bottle was thrown at Jared's head, the TV turns on and off on its own. Jared's dog was with them that evening. When this all began, the dog got up on his back legs and began to growl like they had never heard before. It was deep, menacing, and guttural. The dog's hackles were raised, and he starts ducking down behind the back of the couch, quickly popping back up, growled that deep growl, and then repeated it all. The dog did this for a full 30 seconds. Jer knows what the dog is seeing, but doesn't know what to do. And so as he sits frozen, it begins to get even weirder. He looks up to see that hovering above the couch was what looked like a huge black velvet knot in midair that just kept 
coiling around itself, getting bigger and bigger. Now, at first, he thought he must have been hallucinating, but with how the dog was reacting, he knew he couldn't be. They say never to show fear to a demon, and so he instead decided to shove his hand into the middle of it. It was the coldest feeling he had ever felt, and the knot dissipated after a few seconds. Jared also encountered Bigfoot. Now, this is his story. It was a starlit night, and he loved to walk around in the woods when the sky was clear at night. Sometimes he even tried to get lost in the woods to see if he could find his way out. A little sadistic, if you ask me. On this particular night, he and his friends John and Dave decided to go into the forest near John's house. The woods seemed extremely dark when they got there because of how open and clear the night sky was. The dread feeling began washing over him again, a feeling that was all too familiar. They walked up the road a bit until they were in front of a house where John's older brother's best friend used to live. Jared remembers telling his friends that since they were standing underneath the only streetlight on the road, they were very vulnerable since everyone and everything could see them, but they could not see anything. Just then, Jared heard a chain rattling. He asked John if perhaps this family had a dog and John replied that he didn't think they did. Now, as soon as John had responded, they heard what sounded like someone jumping on a pile of sticks and they quickly began to run. Now, as they were making their way out of the woods, they noticed that all the tree branches were shaking. It appears as though the trees themselves were being rattled. The group consensus was that it had to be Bigfoot. What was stranger was then that when they stopped to listen, the shaking also stopped. And eventually the trees on the side just stopped and the others simply trailed off. Jared prepared for an ambush. Dave checked under the car and they all got in and took off. Jared later found out that the young man who had lived in the home they were standing in front of had died right there on that porch. Now, it's safe to say Jared has had a number of unusual experiences. What do you guys think? One of the men involved in the Ape Canyon attack authored a short pamphlet outlining not only the entire night, but the events leading up to it. His name was Fred Beck. It is in the words of Fred where we find some of the oddest details so often left out of the Ape Canyon narrative. Details which seem to indicate that something far stranger, maybe even paranormal, happened that night. While most cryptozoologists treat the Ape Canyon story as proof of gigantic flesh and blood animals, Fred felt that their cabin had been attacked by, for lack of a better term, spirits. The suppression of Fred's testimony is frustrating. Accounts from eyewitnesses are the bedrock of any investigation into the unknown. I mean, if you wish to treat these topics seriously, eyewitness testimony should be heard, especially if it comes from a primary witness like Fred Beck. Now, whether they saw a large animal or whether they saw something stranger, they deserve evaluation. This isn't to say that we have to believe everybody's opinion of what they saw, but rather that their testimony deserves to be shared just as much as the words of someone who saw something more conventional. This is the real story of what happened in Ape Canyon in 1924. Now, Fred Beck finally committed his memories to paper on September 27th, 1967, with the help of his son, Ronald A. Beck. Fred outlined his thoughts and recollections as best he could in a booklet entitled, I Fought the Ape Men of Mount St. Helens, Washington. The result is short, just shy of 10,000 words, but is truly invaluable. No one argues whether or not Fred was there that summer night in 1924, regardless of what happened. And to have so much first-hand testimony so well thought out is truly a treasure. Fred opens his book by saying this, It is my intention in this book to not only tell you about the historic encounter I had with these mysterious creatures, but also to reveal to the public what I believe they are. Truth often is stranger than fiction, but the strangeness comes from the clouds surrounding our minds, not from the mystery itself. Now, this is not a large book, but 
May the largeness be conveyed by the picture I hope to paint of truth. Much has been written about the day in 1924, and I feel it right that I express my views at last. Fred makes no bones about those views, which always tended towards the mystical even at an early age. He had always considered himself mildly clairvoyant, although a more accurate description might be that he had always been helped by his spirit guides. One of the examples that he provides happened as a child. He had saved up enough money to buy a bean shooter, but had lost it after playing in a field. Remember, it was a simpler time. Fortnite did not exist yet for you youngins. So, the loss of his favorite toy, so expensive to a child that it might as well have been irreplaceable, had left young Fred inconsolable. As he lay in the meadow crying, Fred said that a loving presence came to him in the form of a kindly woman. Now, this figure wrapped her arms around Fred in a warm embrace and reassured him, saying, "'Little boy, don't cry. Go home. You will find your bean shooter there.' And according to Fred, that is exactly what had happened. The easiest explanation is that he had simply misplaced it in a fit of childhood distraction. But according to Fred, this was a brand new identical bean shooter. He discovered his original toy years later, bent and broken, the rubber bands long since rotten. Fred's relationship with this strange woman would continue throughout his childhood. During long church sermons, he would often lay down on the hard wooden pews of his parents' Adventist church. Often, the woman's lap would be there to cradle his head. Whenever he mentioned this to his parents, they said it was his imagination. There was never anybody else there. And once he grew into an adult, Fred became a spiritualist, and he claimed to have had many visions throughout his lifetime. This, of course, opens Fred's word up to criticism, especially from anyone who feels that Bigfoot is strictly a flesh and blood animal. However, there are many tribes and many natives that would disagree, but I digress. Anyone claiming that they experienced supernatural visitors in childhood is obviously a kook, right? I mean, come on, the supernatural doesn't exist, or so they claim, and the rest of their testimony should be thrown out. Now, this is unfair. While Fred's metaphysical leanings heavily color his interpretation of the 1924 events, it does not mean that we have to abandon the whole of his account, including the strange events, which, according to him, were witnessed by other miners. Today, cryptozoologists typically cherry-pick Fred Beck's story, using only the parts that confirm their own biases. Yet, much of what we know about the Ape Canyon events come from Fred's pen. To that end, he also provided an excellent overview of the pivotal days beforehand. And even from the start, strange things seemed afoot, things filled with what Fred called the psychic element. Fred even claimed that the method by which they discovered the Ape Canyon mining claim had been psychically influenced. Fred wrote this, In 1922, we found the location of our mind. A spiritual being, a large native dressed in buckskin, appeared to us and talked to us. He was the picture of stateliness himself. He never told us his name, but we always called him the Great Spirit. He replied once, the great spirit is above me. We are all the great spirit if we listen when the great spirit talks. There was another spiritual being which appeared to us, more in the role of a comforting friend, and we learned her name. One of our party suggested later that we name our mine after her. And so the mining claim we later filed bore her last name, Vanderwhite. The big native being told us there would be a white arrow going before us. Another man who was not present during the attack in 1924 could see the arrow easily and clearly at all times. And I could see it nearly as well. So we started by the Lewis River, south of Mount St. Helens, and went up the Muddy River. In all, we followed the white arrow for days. The going was slow, for in those days it was very rugged territory. 
Hank's temper and lack of proper aim was growing short as he climbed the hills. He had always been a believer of spiritual things, and afterwards, he was certainly a believer. But he lost his temper and cussed. He swore at the spirit leading us. His face was red, and we could not stop him. Just a wild goose chase, he exclaimed. They lied to us and got us running all over the hills, and I want nothing more to do with them. He went on and on. Then... Just when he had started to calm down, we all saw the arrow soar up high, change direction, and then swoop down. We had to follow in the general direction before we could find it again. It hovered near the top of the north cliff of Ape Canyon. That was the site where we later blasted out our shaft. We got a little closer, and we all saw the image of a large door open, and the big native appeared in front of it. He spoke. Because you have cursed the spirit leading you, you will be shown where there is gold, but it is not given to you. With those words, he disappeared. Then we saw the door slowly close. There was a huge lock and latch, but as the door shut, the lock did not latch. A closed door, but it was not locked. We just as well pack up and go home, one of the party said, and that is just the way our gold mine turned out, closed, but not locked. We worked that mine for two years, and one assay showed well over $2,000 a ton. But as it turned out, what we had actually done was to cut the leaders. There is a pocket of gold in that cliff if somebody is fortunate enough to find it. We gave up looking for it. There's a lot to unpack in Fred's words. Native American spirit guides, the apparition of a lady, a white arrow in the sky... What is this doing in a story about Bigfoot? Now, in some ways, the first anomaly is the easiest to understand. While plenty of indigenous tribes hold that Bigfoot is a flesh and blood animal, there are many others that believe it is a spirit, or at the very least, that it is a physical with inexplicable spiritual powers. In fact, the appearance of a Native American spirit guide suggests the existence of a spirit world as described by the country's original inhabitants, or at least something beyond the physical realm we all know and live in. Whether this spirit realm objectively resembles indigenous cosmology or not, it implies that something else lies beyond the fringes of human perception. At the very least, it provides further insight into Fred Beck's worldview. The strange vision of the lady is a little more interesting, at least compared to other Bigfoot stories. In the 2020 Bigfoot book series Where the Footprint Ends, researcher and podcaster Timothy Renner uncovered a bizarre trend that, time and time again throughout world mythologies, Wild men are often paired with women in white. The association is perhaps ancient. For example, in parts of England, folklore holds that the oldest tree is an apple orchard, is said to embody the spirit of a wild man known as the ape tree man. This wild man is assisted by another spirit, that of an elderly woman, Draped in white. Even as far back as the 1400s, an old English saying held that any woman who died a virgin would not only suffer, be damned, but suffer an especially cruel fate. Such as die maids do all lead apes in hell. It went. Now, this statement is more complex than it seems. I mean, there's some anti Catholic sentiment in there, among other things, but. The idea is that undesirable creatures would have their way with maidens after they died. The color most closely associated with the purity of maidens was, of course, the color white. Now, these associations endure to this day. Consider the classic image of King Kong, the enormous ape clutching the damsel in distress who almost always wears the color white. Some Bigfoot encounters feature strange women in white, either at the symbolic level or literally. One of the most popular stories on the Sasquatch Chronicles podcast features a pair of brothers who were dealing with Bigfoot encounters and other mysterious phenomena around their land. Among the other presences that they had run into was an elderly woman who sometimes crossed their property. 
Now, she seemed to be in her 60s, but was abnormally tall and always wore ragged, dirty white clothing. Her oversized shoes were white as well. Now, this woman would appear when the Bigfoot were vocalizing and seemed able to vanish at will. After consulting a psychic medium, the brothers learned that she was not a human being, but rather something which took the appearance of a human, perhaps a demon. The medium told the two brothers that she possessed control over the Bigfoot creatures, like a puppeteer, which emerged from the earth at her command. It's a wild story, yes, but completely consistent from a folkloric perspective. So, returning to the Ape Canyon story, we have a spectral woman appearing to Fred Beck and the other miners, leading them to a part of Washington State where they would run afoul of wild men. While Fred Beck never described the woman in any detail, remember that he said they named their mining claim after her. The name was Vander White. It seems at least possible that she was dressed in white. If not, there is at least white in her name. Finally, there is the arrow in the sky, which should make anyone interested in UFOs take notice. There isn't much to add to this detail beyond remarking on how similar signs and portents stretch back millennia and were often regarded as divine blessings or omens. If only the era were better described, we could learn a little bit more. Did it resemble a structured craft, a light, or simply a wisp of cloud? Now, it is interesting to note that not everyone could see the arrow consistently. This aspect, while rarely discussed, appears in quite a few modern UFO reports, where only certain members of a group will see something in the sky. Even when everyone does agree that they saw a UFO, descriptions can vary wildly from one person to another person, with some describing different shapes, different color lights, and other particulars. Now, for six years, Fred and the gold miners worked their claim, always in good spirits, but never able to shake the sense that they would leave empty-handed. They noticed oddities right away. Among these were immense footprints. On at least one occasion, these tracks were left in a place that defied all rational explanation. Before the men erected their cabin, they stayed in a small tent alongside one of the canyon's many creeks. In the center of the creek was a sandbar, perhaps an acre or so in size. Now, each morning, the men would visit the creek to wash their utensils and fetch water. But one morning, they found something inexplicable. And Fred wrote this. Early one morning, Hank came back to the tent. He was rather excited. He led us to the moist sandbar and took us almost to the center. There we were, standing in the middle of the sandbar and... Not one of us could conceive any earthly thing taking steps 160 feet long. No human being could have made these tracks, Hank said, and there's only one way that they could have been made. Something dropped from the sky and went back up. Now, the appearance of footprints in places where they couldn't or shouldn't be is something that Bigfoot hunters run into regularly in the field. Bigfoot trackways sometimes end in vast open meadows, or footprints might appear all by themselves outside of any other trackway. Sometimes, these discrepancies can be easily explained away. Perhaps the creatures stepped to another bit of ground that did not transfer their footprints, or maybe they leapt into a nearby tree. Now, these explanations are reasonable enough. But other scenarios, like the one Fred Beck and his miners discovered, defy all rational explanation. Now, some cryptozoologists say that Bigfoot are capable of superhuman leaps. It is true that many sightings feature Bigfoot bounding away with an athletic grace typically reserved for animals like kangaroos. But when footprints end in a vast open field with hundreds of feet of untouched ground all around them... These explanations fail. The two animals that hold the record for jumping distances are the snow leopard and the clip springer, a type of African antelope. Both seem capable of jumping 50 feet horizontally. Now, for Bigfoot to leap 100 feet, they would have to be the greatest jumpers in the animal kingdom. 
So what do we do? Where the footprints end? Some think that Bigfoot tiptoe backwards and retrace their tracks. Others think that Bigfoot grab a branch and smooth out their footprints, removing all traces of their escape routes. Neither explanation seems especially convincing. I mean, surely backtracking would leave more evidence. Bigfoot researchers who are trained to scrutinize the tiniest details of footprints rarely notice evidence of a second footfall in these tracks. And even the most careful attempt to brush away an exit route through mud or snow especially would leave obvious indications that the trackway had been tampered with. Then, to make things even stranger, we have solitary footprints, like the ones that the Ape Canyon miners encountered with no approach whatsoever. It is like Hank said, something dropped from the sky and went back up. The gold miners also became used to unnerving noises around their claim, which flooded the canyon both day and night. Some of the sounds resembled screams, while others sounded like a booming thumping sound, just like something was hitting itself on the chest. Where the noise was coming from always proved difficult to pinpoint. In fact, Fred wrote this, The same thudding hollow thumping noise we heard at night preceded the attack. We also had heard in broad daylight, although not nearly so loud. One of our party was a little irritated with me. On our excursions, he usually led the way and I followed a little behind the others. We kept hearing that sound and occasionally he'd turn around and would say, what's that? After six or eight times of him doing this and after a few general discussions about the noise, he quickly turned around one more time and eyed me and said, By golly, boys, it's not Fred making that noise after all. But he decided to give it a double check. He made an excuse and wandered away from the camp. Where he came back, he said, Now I'm certain it's none of us. I walked for half an hour and everywhere I went, I heard it. It sounds like there's a hollow drum in the earth somewhere and something or someone is hitting it. Now, this noise is familiar to students of the paranormal. It appears at numerous places with high Bigfoot activity. Perhaps most famously for those of you in Washington State is the Yakima Indian Reservation. Subterranean sounds are also a staple of UFO lore, where they represent underground alien bases or fairy folklore, where they might represent entities like dwarves living or working deep underground. Now, during this time mining around Mount St. Helens, Fred Beck claimed another bizarre encounter. He was walking the trail from Spirit Lake one afternoon when he began to feel incredibly lonely. As he rounded a curve, a beautiful young lady stood in his path. The two began talking with the immediate familiarity that old friends might share, and he learned that she and her father visited every summer and that he was away hunting in the forest. She was one of the most pleasant persons I had ever spoken to in my life, Fred said. When we parted, she told me where she and her father were camped and asked me to visit them that evening. When he visited that night, Fred was surprised how far away their camp was from where they had met. The girl, who seemed no more than 18, must be quite hardy to have hiked so far alone. Nonetheless, Fred arrived at camp where he found the girl, but no sign of her father. In fact, there was no sign of anything. Fred noticed that there were no cooking utensils, no food, and no tent. What's more, she would regularly address her father, even though there was nobody else around. The conversation they held that night matched the summer evening. Pleasant, but more than a bit odd. After enjoying their chat, Fred left in a sort of daze. Only in hindsight did he realize how peculiar everything had been. There was another event prior to the Ape Canyon siege that places Fred Beck's encounter firmly in the realm of the paranormal. He seems to have experienced what parapsychologists would call an apport. Apports are common in hauntings and especially in poltergeist cases, where they often manifest stones, bits of glass, and other odds and ends. Now, in Fred's case, his apport seemed to be brought about by his need for something with which to write. He explained the event. One day, we needed a pencil to make a description of our claim. 
We found we had not brought one along with us. Everybody was a little put out. But then it came, a pencil was in my hand. It had tooth marks all over it. When that trip was over and I was home, I showed the pencil to my wife and she said, why, that's a pencil I bought when you were gone. How did you get it? She said my oldest son, then a young tot, was chewing on it and she took it away from him and had put it in a drawer. She went and looked for it and found no pencil. Now, this may have not have been the only apport that took place at Ape Canyon. One reading of the stones and boulders that rained upon the cabin during the Bigfoot assault is that they may have been apports themselves. Showers of stones are so common in the parapsychological literature that the phenomenon even has its own name, lithoboli. That's a fun word to say. Say it with me, everybody. Lithoboli. Accounts of lithoboli stretch back incredibly early and feature in some of the most famous poltergeist cases. Now, in these events, stones rain upon the roofs of haunted houses, sometimes for days on end, appearing seemingly out of nowhere. Now, if the Bigfoot encountered at Ape Canyon represents some sort of spirit phenomenon, then perhaps these stones they supposedly threw at the cabin were actually a ports in a parapsychological sense. What do you think? Now, these are often the bits and pieces that are swept under the rug whenever folks discuss the Ape Canyon attack. We must ask ourselves, what are the odds that someone with a history of psychic activity would encounter a flesh and blood Bigfoot? This isn't to say that it's impossible, but consider this. Psychic phenomena are rare. Seeing a Bigfoot is also rare. How much rarer is it to experience both, sometimes in the same place? It takes very little imagination to connect the two somehow. It seems as if an aura of high strangeness emanated from around both Fred Beck and the Ape Canyon site itself. In his booklet, Fred goes on to describe the attack on the cabin. It is from his testimony that many retellings draw the details of the event. It's interesting to note that it may have been the curious underground sounds that set everyone on edge that day. Hank especially, I mean, we already know he's a terrible shot, and now this? It was after hearing the noises that Hank suggested everybody take their rifles with them to the woods. I mean, because we know we couldn't rely on him to make the shot. And so Fred wrote this. Hank asked me to accompany him to the spring, about 100 yards from our cabin, to get some water and suggested we take our rifles just to be on the safe side. We walked to the spring, and then Hank yelled and raised his rifle, and at that instant, I saw it. It was a hairy creature, and he was about a 100 yards away, on the other side of the little canyon, standing by a pine tree. It dodged behind the tree, poking its head out from the side of the tree, and at the same time, Hank shot. Imagine that. I could see the bark fly out from the tree from each of his shots, and imagine that he missed. Someone may say that that was quite a distance to see the bark fly, but I saw it. The creature I judged to have been about seven feet tall with blackish brown hair. It disappeared from our view for a short time, but then we saw it, running fast and upright about 200 yards down the little canyon. I shot three times before it disappeared from view, pulling a hank and missing entirely. The siege then unfolded in Fred's booklet, just as we discussed in the beginning, a curious postscript to the events absent from the most presentations of the Ape Canyon events, comes from the October 29th, 1967 edition of the Oregonian. The article claims that a group of Bigfoot attacked a miner's cabin near Mount St. Helens in 1924, leaving behind tracks all of the right foot, the perfect one-legged ape track. Now, this story obviously refers to the Ape Canyon incident. While the author of the article clearly included this detail to discredit the miners' claims, one-legged trackways are another persistent anomaly in Bigfoot reports. They're not found often, but they're found often enough and only add to the mysterious aura around the phenomenon. Now, for years afterward, Fred Beck wrestled with how to incorporate the events of that day into his own spiritual worldview. In I Fought the Ape Men on Mount St. Helens, Washington, he eventually concluded this. Since that day in 1924, I have went on and progressed and have learned much. 
And now I can look back and put the puzzle together from the reservoir of knowledge I have acquired and learned. In the true sense, everything in the material world is a manifestation. Ever since the time the first essence of consciousness formed from the great void that we cannot describe, different planes or dimensions of beings were created or manifested. Occasionally, we of this dimension of space can be conscious of other beings of a different vibration and consciousness. The abominable snowmen are from a lower plane. When the condition and vibration is at a certain frequency, they can easily, for a time, appear in a very solid body. They are not animal spirits, but also lack the intelligence of a human consciousness. This is, of course, when reading of evolution, we have read many times conjecture about the missing link between man and the anthropoid ape. The snowmen are a missing link in consciousness, neither animal nor human. No one will ever capture one, and no one will ever kill one. In other words, present to the world, a living one in a cage, or find a dead body of one to be examined by science. Now, naturally, none of this sits well with orthodox cryptozoologists who are heavily invested in the idea that, someday, we will be able to capture or kill a Bigfoot specimen. Couple Fred's controversial statement with his fantastic life, and you get the perfect recipe for a story which will be cherry-picked or ignored outright. Now, to that end, some cryptozoologists have done their best to discredit Fred Beck, both calling his booklet into question and engaging in character assassination. Some say that Fred's son, who helped him write the book, injected his own viewpoints. Others slander Fred, saying that he had gone senile by the time he recorded his memoir. Remember, these are attacks from people who believe in Bigfoot. There are skeptical arguments as well. They find ample room for attack in Fred's metaphysical views and even call into question the Ape Canyon incident itself. In 1983, claims emerged that local YMCA students may have been responsible for the event. Before Mount St. Helens erupted, youths at Camp Meehan near Spirit Lake would be brought to the edge of Ape Canyon, where they would often toss stones into the gorge below. It's an interesting possibility, but... How many YMCA youth have hairy ape-like arms, like the one that reached into the cabin? And we are left with so many questions regarding Ape Canyon. Is it a true tale, a hoax, or a misidentification? If true, does it represent an attack by an unknown species of animal, or something from the realm of nightmares? We can't summarize the events more elegantly than Fred Beck himself. I have lived with this experience with the abominable snowman. I have encountered them on the slopes of Mount St. Helens. I have looked deep into myself to tell you of their nature. I have had both the earthly experience of encountering them by Ape Canyon and the spiritual experience of knowing and telling what they are. I Just 11 miles from the southern tip of Lookout Mountain sits Somerville, Georgia. Now, this small town enjoyed a boom period in the earliest part of the 20th century, with visitors drawn from miles around to take in not only Lookout Mountain itself, but also the surrounding area's scenic hikes, hot springs, and caverns. It served as a welcome retreat for those who had grown weary of life in the big cities of Atlanta and Nashville. For these reasons, an opera house was constructed in Somerville. While such a cultured addition might seem out of place in the sleeping town today, at the time it was a huge success, appealing to the refined sensibilities of the out-of-towners who descended upon North Georgia in those years. However, interest eventually waned, leading to the opera house's conversion to a cinema, then, more recently, a bed and breakfast owned and operated by the Wainwright family. Or, should I say, owned and opera-rated. <laughs> the Wainwrights soon learned that they had a problem on their hands. Things went smoothly enough at first, but they began to notice that some guests consistently cut their stays abruptly short. After a time, a pattern began emerging. Nobody would stay longer than a few nights in room 2D. Eventually, Mr. Wainwright started asking these visitors why they were all so eager to leave. He discovered a consistent complaint. Footsteps were always heard pacing the hallway immediately outside of room 2D. Inevitably, the guest would get up and open the door, 
only to find not only that these sounds had ceased, but there wasn't anybody in the hallway. Guest would simply shrug and close the door, at which point the pacing would begin anew. At least on one occasion, this phantom pacing was accompanied by a low mumbling. Not a dialogue between two people, but more like the way someone might mutter under their breath to themselves when distressed. A check of the hallway would reveal not a soul in sight. Whereas most you lurklings would be clamoring to check into room 2D, most of the visitors to the opera house bed and breakfast wanted nothing of the sort. Predictably, the rumors that arose around the haunted room began to negatively impact the business. Mr. Wainwright was determined to put an end to this tomfoolery once and for all. He scoured local archives, hoping to either find nothing and put the superstitions to rest, or to find some sort of explanation to what was going on in his bed and breakfast. Now, to his surprise, he unearthed several tantalizing clues, lending support to the reality of the haunting. One blueprint for the original opera house showed that a balcony had since overlooked the stage where room 2D now sat, a stage where actors might pace or talk to themselves. A newspaper article, on the other hand, suggested a grisly history for the entertainment venue. It had been the site of a murder. Sometime during its original purpose as a theater, the opera house had put on a play which, due to its popularity, extended its run. With so much time spent together, it should have come as little surprise that the leading actor and actress became close. A little too close, in fact. The husband of the leading lady, who also happened to be the production's director, grew jealous of how much time she was spending with her co-star. Now, his wife thought his objections were silly. However, and in response, amped up her flirtations with the lead actor. All of this came to a head when, in a fit of jealous rage, the director confronted the actor after one of the performances and bam, 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 shot him dead. This was followed by a second death. The actress, distraught, fell from the balcony to her own death. Although it was ruled a suicide, whispers in the community of Somerville suggested foul play, as her husband had been supposedly spotted where she had fallen just moments later. Either way, the director was never charged for any of these tragedies and simply left town shortly afterward. Gee, that's not suspicious at all. Following this bloody evening, the opera house was shuttered and remained so until it was revived as a movie theater. Now, even this harrowing series of events failed to convince Mr. Wainwright that his property was haunted. At the same time, his opinion mattered little, as his bed and breakfast slowly saw fewer and fewer guests. Eventually, the Wainwrights decided to overnight in room 2D themselves to prove that the hauntings were all just nonsense. According to locals, they fled Somerville the following morning, leaving the building for sale. Holy crap. They left in such a hurry that they didn't even bother to pack up any of their furnishings. What happened? The subsequent owners, having heard these stories, decided to never, ever rent out room 2D. Instead, they kept the door securely locked, using the space for storage. However, they would often venture inside to find items curiously rearranged, despite the restricted access they imposed. Finally, the door to room 2D was paneled over, the only sign of its existence left as a small window on the rear of the building. Ever since, however, rumor has it that, late at night, lights could be seen shining through the window of the inaccessible room. And just under six miles west of Lookout Mountain's summit sits Trenton, Georgia. Here, you can easily see one of Lookout Mountain's coves, a small valley cutting between a pair of ridgelines closed at one end. Starting in the 1920s, this was the site of a moonshining operation known as the Stover Still. The still provided financial support for the Stovers over several generations. The earliest members of the family to utilize the cove had discovered a small cave in the cliffside high upon a sheer bluff. It was 
the perfect place for illegal activity like moonshining and, in 2020, hand sanitizer. There was a natural spring which flowed through the cave but did not flow out of it. This was advantageous for two reasons. One, it meant that clean water, a key ingredient, was easily accessible for the operation of the still. And two, its failure to exit the cave meant that there was no waterfall to draw attention from nosy sightseers. From a distance, the entrance was well obscured by the surrounding treetops and limbs. To make it even more suitable for a still, the only safe, quick way to access the cave was by a rope ladder that had been installed at great effort. In other words, the revenuers would probably never find the cave, and even if they did, there was no way that the stovers would be caught unaware. The Stover family hauled their equipment into the cave using ropes, set up a booming business. The only problem would be the smoke they're still produced, a telltale sign for any government agent seeking out illegal liquor production. However, the Stovers came up with an ingenious solution. They fed the stovepipe into the fissure where the steam disappeared, shoving it as deep as they could. When they hooked up their equipment, the smoke was fed deep in the side of the lookout mountain, where it somehow dissipated through the cracks and furrows in the earth, leaving behind no trace of their still. The stover still was as perfect as anybody could hope. A guard was posted at the mouth of the cave day and night to guard the family investment and keep a lookout for the revenuers. To signal family members below, the guards would use mirrors in the daytime and lanterns at night. Everything went smoothly for years, and it wasn't until an in-law spilled the beans to a rival family of moonshiners, the Garners, that things took a turn for the worse. Remember, no matter how bad your brother-in-law may be, at least he didn't rat you out to a family of bloodthirsty moonshiners. You see, the Garners always envied the Stover's success. It wasn't that their product was inferior, however. They simply kept getting caught while the Stovers, hidden in their mountainside cave, operated completely outside of the law and uncaught. No, well, at least for a time. Armed with knowledge of the cave's whereabouts from the in-laws with a grudge, the Garners set out to capture the Stover still and make it their own. At the same time, other Garners, many of whom were in prison for bootlegging, had also provided the revenuers with enough hints that they also knew the general location of the Stover Still. What unfolded was a race to Stover Still with three competing factions. The Stovers defending their claim, the Garners hoping to occupy the location, and the government seeking to end all their illegal activity. I mean, after all, if you can't make money on it, then it can't happen. When the revenuers arrived, they found the two families of moonshiners locked in a fierce, bloody battle and instead decided to sit back and see how everything played out. Rule number one, never let a good crisis go to waste. In fact, the fighting became so vicious that all participants from both families were slaughtered, with the exception of one fighter who was so badly wounded he later succumbed to his injuries and perished. The revenuers, on the other hand, had won the day without firing a single shot. With its secret location compromised, nobody could or would set up shop at Stover Still without immediately drawing the attention of authorities. The entire setup was left in the cave to rust, the rope ladder left to rot away. Despite the total obliteration of both families, something lingered on in the cave in the cove. Within months, people began seeing strange lights on the mountain in the vicinity of the still. Yet every investigation in the light of day revealed the Stover still in complete disrepair. No one would have any good reason to be up there. Still, the lights continued and have to this very day. Many describe what appears to be a lantern swinging back and forth around the old cave and in the woods below, sometimes accompanied by the sounds of gunfire or disembodied voices shouting. On one occasion, a brave local boy approached the location of the cave after seeing the lights one night. As he reached the foot of the cliffside, however, the tree he stood beside twice exploded in a fury of wood chips and bark, as if hit by two invisible bullets. 
shots which the boy never heard fired. The young explorer left as quickly as his feet would carry him back to the safety of town and far away from Lookout Mountain, where two families of bootleggers remain locked in perpetual battle for control of Stover Still. About seven miles east of Lookout Mountain's southernmost point sits the small unincorporated community of Valley Head, Georgia. While now it sees a few tourists looking for a taste of the great outdoors, it once was primarily settled by farmers whose property ownership stretches back to before the Civil War. One farm on the outskirts of town has been in the hands of several successive generations and actually saw some skirmishes during the Civil War. According to locals, two of the fields on this farm are separated by a fence and a gate to keep the cattle out a gate that is always kept locked, or is supposed to be, at least. However, about once a month, the owners find the gate wide open. No matter how securely they latch it, to make things even stranger, none of the cows ever pass through this barrier. It is if they know it is not meant for them. They simply stand there and stare, lazily chewing their cud as the farmers go and latch it once more. Great cheese comes from happy cows. Happy cows stay the hell out of the haunted field. Their family has even built their own legend around the stubborn gate. According to the local farmers, the gate is unlatched by those lost souls who perished during the Civil War on their land, around 160 years ago. Their story even comes with a southern fried punchline. They must be Yankee ghosts, they say, because any self-respecting southern gentleman would know to shut the gate behind them. Our final tale comes from Valley Head as well, although it is also from a different state. 20 miles southwest of Valley Head, Georgia, sits Valley Head, Alabama, still close to Lookout Mountain. So pull out your PBR beers, folks, and get ready for this one. Here off Highway 11, near Interstate 59, sits Sequoia Caverns, once another major subterranean tourist attraction. The caverns get their name from the creator of the Cherokee alphabet, a man by the name of Sequoia, also called George Guess. Now, to this day, Sequoia's alphabet is one of the few examples in recorded history where a member of a culture without a writing system was able to create a literate method of recording. Thanks to his efforts, the Cherokee Nation was one of the first indigenous tribes to claim a written language. Until recently, Sequoia Caverns were operated by the same family for generations, which has owned the property since 1842. Sadly, it closed in 2013. By all accounts, it was a marvelous place to visit, boasting numerous reflecting pools, underground lakes, magnificent formations, and other darker things beneath the earth. Tragically, Sequoia Caverns may have been the final resting place of some Cherokee hiding from their forced removal during the Trail of Tears. Here, they either hid so long that they starved or became lost in the pitch blackness of the subterranean chambers. It is said that their spirits still linger. Ever since it was open to the public, visitors to Sequoia Caverns reported odd occurrences. What sounded like sorrowful wails and moans could be heard seeping up from the deepest parts of the cavern. And sometimes, people will even report the smell of Sabaro pizza. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. One space, which earned the nickname the Chamber of Grief, also left visitors with an oppressive sense of sadness. A depression which only deepened the longer they remained. This reputation strengthened until some guides eventually began leaving the Chamber of Grief out of their tours altogether. There were also persistent problems with lights, which always seemed to extinguish themselves along one particular path. In fact, the problem got so predictable that visitors were encouraged to pack an extra light for themselves whenever they made the journey underground. Now, one such unlucky visitor to Sequoia Caverns was a young lady whom we'll call Taylor. And no, not Taylor Swift. Taylor was exploring the chambers on her own when she tripped and fell, breaking her flashlight and her boyfriend's heart. Just kidding. She tried to fight off panic, but found it slowly creeping in nonetheless as she lay in the darkness, trying to think of the best way to escape. That was when, from the inky blackness, a faint glow manifested. 
Taylor cast her eyes in its direction only to see a figure within the light, a figure which she later claimed resembled a Cherokee man. The specter never spoke a word, but instead silently gestured for Taylor to follow him. Taylor walked in the footsteps of her benevolent guide, tracing behind him until at last she saw daylight up ahead. Her relief caused tears to well up in her eyes, and she turned to thank her mysterious rescuer, only to find no sign of the glowing man. She stumbled out into the safety of daylight, forever grateful to whatever spirits dwelled within Sequoia Caverns. The area around Chattanooga, Tennessee, and Lookout Mountain seems to have more than its fair share of paranormal activity. If you just visited there for business or for vacation, you might not notice it, at least not right away. No one tends to think of Chattanooga as a supernatural hotspot. I mean, at the same time, all the oddities, the myths and legends, and the sightings around Lookout Mountain reveal one fundamental truth something all of us who seek out the strange should remember. You don't need to travel to some far-flung location to find the supernatural. Often it's not. It is lurking in your own backyard. But now about an hour and 20 minutes drive from Roanoke Island sits Hatteras Island, one of the most famous destinations in the Outer Banks. It is home to the most iconic of the Outer Banks, five lighthouses, the famous Cape Hatteras Light, which in 1999 was famously relocated 2,900 feet further inland from the eroding coastline. Before GPS, lighthouses fulfilled an invaluable role in maritime safety. Since the early 1800s, however, another protector has guarded the shores of Hatteras, it is said that during hurricanes, an old man wearing a Suester hat appears somewhere between the lighthouse and Cape Point, beckoning anyone caught in the storm to seek shelter. Now, apparently, sometime before the Revolutionary War, a schooner named St. Francis ran around in the Diamond Shoals, killing everyone aboard except a young Spanish seaman. He was rescued by a young Indian princess named White Cloud, who nursed him back to health. Over the course of his recovery, the two fell in love, and much to their surprise, her father, the chief, consented to the Union. However, the Spaniard wished to return home, if only briefly, to collect an inheritance that was waiting for him. He promised that he would return to his love as a rich man. With that, the Spaniard sailed away, never to be heard from again. Yet, over the days, weeks, months, and years that followed, his bride-to-be never lost faith. Instead, standing at the Cape, looking across the ocean for her long-lost lover. At last, White Cloud lay upon her deathbed. When asked if there was anything she would like, she replied that her only wish was to spend eternity waiting for the Spaniard's return. And there, it is said, she lingers yet above the turbulent tides off Cape Hatteras as a lonely little white cloud. It seems that this whole area is no stranger to the bizarre and unexplained, for an anonymous fisherman had submitted their account while fishing near the Pamlico River, they experienced something they could not explain that terrified them. I was fishing at the Pamlico River. I was by myself and had been there for a while. The fish weren't biting and I was getting bored. I decided to try a new spot. I was in the boat and moved to a new area. I was sitting on the edge of the boat, facing the river, when I saw something to my right. I thought it was a person by a tree, but it was too tall to be a person. It was almost as tall as the tree it was standing next to. I'm not sure if it's height, but I would guess seven to eight feet tall. It was very broad-shouldered and grayish in color. It looked like it was trying to hide behind the tree. I stared at it for a few seconds, not sure what to do, and it stared back at me. I started the boat, looking back to see if it was still there. It was gone. I thought I had imagined it, or it was maybe just my mind playing tricks on me. I continued to fish, but kept watching the shoreline. And I had this sinking feeling that something wasn't right, that something was watching me. I decided to call it a day and start heading back to the docks. Once I was halfway, something hit the boat. I thought it was a branch or something. So I looked over the side and, and could see it was not a branch. 
I don't know what it was, but it was long and slender and appeared to be rapidly moving towards my boat. Now, this frightened me. I started the motor and got out of there. I locked the doors and sat in the back of my truck once I got back to shore. I don't know what it was, but it scared me. I'm not sure if it was a big dog or a wolf or something staring at me through the trees. All I know is that it wasn't a dog because it was too tall and had really long arms. I don't know what it was. I'm not a big guy, but I'm no coward. I've been in a lot of scrapes and have been in some pretty bad bar fights. I'm not afraid to admit when I'm scared and I'm pretty scared right now typing this up. I'm not sure if I should tell anybody or report it to authorities. I'm not a crackpot looking for attention and I'm not trying to make any money off this. If there is truly something out there, then maybe somebody should know. I'm not sure what I saw, but I know it wasn't a dog. The port town of Edenton in Chowan County nonetheless serves a vital function in the survival of the northern Outer Banks. It is one of the closer big cities within reasonable distance. I mean, this is a relative term. Edenton only has around 4,500 residents. But in the early 1700s, accusations of witchcraft began flying in Chowan County. One of the most famous witch stories of eastern North Carolina occurred at Brown Rig Mill, just a dozen miles north of Edenton. The mill, erected in 1762 along Indian Creek, remained in use for nearly 200 years, offering the community a steady supply of high-quality white meal. At its peak, it also included a cotton gin and a sawmill. Following the American Revolution, the mill fell into the hands of Tim Farrow, a young widower. Tim's wife had left behind a very young daughter to care for, and between raising her and operating the mill, he had his hands full. Now, eventually, however, she grew up, allowing Tim to refocus his efforts on keeping the business running. In addition to working the mill, he was also a skilled woodsman, laboring tirelessly with his double-headed axe kept in the mill above the corn when not in use. Each day after work, Tim would spend an hour or two fishing in the water alongside the mill's dam. It was half hobby, half grocery shopping. Often as not, his efforts landed on the dinner table. On one of these midsummer evenings, Tim set up fishing as he usually did. As afternoon turned to dusk, he began packing his tackle, only to notice a canoe gliding towards his position. Now, given the way the occupant was dressed, Tim first looked her to be an old lady. But to his surprise, it turned to be a ravishingly beautiful woman. Beautiful green eyes, pink cheeks, flowing locks of jet black hair. For Tim, it was love at first sight. The mysterious stranger asked him for food and lodging for the night. A request which Tim did not find suspicious as he had spotted other travelers on the waterway from time to time. Now he obliged and the following morning the woman, we'll call her Tiffany, moved to a vacant room in a widow's home a few miles away before planning to continue on with her journey. But Tim, oh Tim, he could not help himself. The day before Tiffany's scheduled departure, he paid her a visit to confess his sudden love. He was received warmly, and she stayed in the community until a traveling preacher from Edenton came by shortly thereafter. He actually wed Tim and Tiffany, and soon they were living the quintessential domestic lifestyle. To make things even better, Tim's new wife and his daughter, they already had a kid already? Wow. They got along swimmingly. They would often sit by the fireside listening to Tiffany tell the most fantastic tales, stories of ancient Egypt and the Middle East, relayed with such enthusiasm and accuracy, it was almost like she had seen such things herself. However, small towns are susceptible to gossip, and Edenton was no exception. Word began spreading that the marriage was somehow scandalous, and soon enough, everybody was repeating rumors as fact. And that is when a pattern began to emerge. The families whose members had most vocally criticized the woman had began experiencing a litany of troubles. Livestock fell ill and died for no apparent reason. The gossipers themselves followed shortly thereafter. Sabara was erected. Local doctors were perplexed by these undiagnosable ailments. 
I'm just joking about the Sabaro thing. The Gospers knew something was going on, though. Tim Farrow had married a witch. Yeah, get in line, buddy. Some said that they saw a cow keel over and die after Tiffany passed its pasture. Others claimed that a grandmother of one of the families lingered in bed for days, completely delirious and speaking an unknown language. Hmm. When she finally recovered, she mumbled something about a strange lady who had worn the same clothing as Tiffany. The witch had stopped in front of her house, staring at the front door while she adjusted her bonnet shortly before the grandmother fell ill. Now, further testimony emerged. The widow whom Tiffany had stayed with said that during her brief time in her house, she had gone to make Tiffany's bed on several occasions, only to find it completely unslept in. The only noticeable disturbance was a large circular depression in the center almost like a giant cat would make it if it had slept on the top sheet. Although the scorn was aimed at Tiffany, Tim was the one who took it the hardest. Workers came to the mill, complaining and threatening to take their business elsewhere, unless his wife ditches and bails out of town now. Things then began to go wrong at Brown Rig Mill. Neatly stacked sacks of grain would be found torn open and spilled each morning. The sluice gates and the dam would be open, even when Tim remembered shutting them. Nails appeared in machinery, bringing work to a loud grinding halt and lowering the quality of the meal. Tongs and other tools would be found misplaced and scattered. Now, Tim suspected he was the victim of harassment. Things only worsened when Tiffany became distant. He was now becoming ghosted and friend-zoned. Yikes. He was now sure she had grown tired and bored of life at the mill. She wanted fun. She wanted a bad boy. To catch the vandals, Tim stayed awake all night for a week. No one arrived and no damage was done, but Tim could not explain how his neighbors could have known that he was lying in wait for them. He was perplexed. Now, three days after abandoning this watch, Tim resolved to try and catch the vandals one last time. He told Tiffany that he was going to the store and would not return until late in the evening. In reality, he hid in the mill behind some meal sacks, waiting patiently as a massive thunderstorm rolled in overhead. It was frightful, cowering through the storm, but eventually the tempest abated. His respite was short-lived, however. The moon had just emerged from the clouds when an owl hooted, whoo, whoo, frightening Tim out of his wits. He regained his composure and continued waiting, sure that the culprits would arrive any minute now. It was then that the frogs began croaking. While this was a common occurrence of the mill, Tim knew in his gut that he had never heard so many croaking so loudly in his life. The cacophony continued to crescendo, but it couldn't drown out the thought that had crept into his head. Frogs were associated with demons and witches. The next entry in the wildlife parade was a host of lightning bugs, which streamed into the mill. There were more fireflies than Tim had ever seen, and they illuminated the interior of the mill in an eerie half-light. All the while, the bellowing frogs continued, and the storm whipped up once again, unleashing a torrent that seemed capable of washing away the entire mill. Without warning, a series of rapid blows struck the front door of Brown Rig Mill. It sounded like hundreds of broomsticks banging against the wood in an incessant clatter, demanding to be let in. Now, the staccato beats accompanying the frogs accelerated into a continuous drum roll until at last the door gave way. Tim watched in horror as 50 or 60 black cats, bigger than any Tim had ever seen before, poured into the doorway. Now, that is a lot of black pussy. In one synchronized motion, they encircled the hapless Miller, pacing around him in a snarling, spitting ring. Every now and then, one would step out of line to take a swipe at him, leaving his clothes shredded and his body bleeding. These attacks became so violent that Tim feared he would bleed out. Looking around for something to defend himself, his eyes settled on the handle of his trusty axe, protruding from the shelf above. He snatched the weapon and immediately brought it down upon the largest of the cats, cleanly severing its right front paw and embedding the axe in the timber beneath. The cat wailed in pain and ran with a limp toward the open doorway, its feline compatriots following suit. 
Within moments, Tim was all alone in the mill. Chapter 2 In that moment, Tim knew that if he was going to escape, this was his chance. Tim shot out onto the pathway home as quickly as he could. He raced through the heavy rain, reaching the door of his cottage, and flung it open. He didn't bother to shut it, and instead ran into the bedroom, his clothes soaking wet. There, on his bed, lay Tiffany amidst a sea of crimson. She glares at him as she cradled the bloody stump of her right arm in her left hand. In the flash of an eye, she transformed back into the massive black cat, bounding off the bed, onto the floor, and out the door. Tim's mind immediately flashed back to the mill. He had been so preoccupied with all the cats that he never thought about the effect this heavy storm would have on the dam. So he races back to the mill, hoping to reach the floodgates in time to open them. He, boys and girls, failed. Tim Farrow was hallway across the dam when it collapsed, taking it with him to his doom. Or so the story goes. Now you have to ask who told the last part of this tale. If Tim was dead and the witch escaped, there weren't any witnesses. The affair at Brown Rig Mill is probably just an old legend. However, there is an interesting postscript to the story. You see, the dam was repaired and the mill sold to another man. He owned it for several years before noticing a large black cat that had begun prowling his property. After getting a glimpse of it up close, he noticed that it was missing, can you imagine, its front right paw. Aware of the legend and wanting to avoid history repeating itself, the new miller supposedly loaded his old musket with all the silver he could find, mostly coins, took aim at the cat as it sunned itself on the dam. He cocked the hammer, pulled the trigger, scoring a direct hit. The cat wailed as it fled into the forest, never to be seen again. Now, the lower tip of the outer banks ends at Cape Lookout. Similar barrier islands continue on down the coast, separated from the mainland by sounds all the way to the South Carolina border. Here lies Wilmington, the largest city in southeastern North Carolina. And in 1895, President Grover Cleveland was traveling the East Coast when his train made a stop in Wilmington at Mako Station to take on additional water and wood. During their brief break, President Cleveland left his car to stretch his legs and walk the tracks a bit. While doing so, he noticed that something struck him as peculiar. The trainmen in this area carried not one, but two lit lanterns. I mean, certainly one would suffice. The president asked the locals at the station why such redundancy was necessary. They told him in no uncertain terms that it was to distinguish actual railroad workers from Joe Baldwin, whose spirit still haunted the rails. The interaction made such an impression on President Cleveland that he mentioned it in several speeches afterward. Joe Baldwin's light, otherwise known as the Mako light, is one of the most famous ghost lights in North Carolina, after the Brown Mountain Lights, of course. Its origin story is similar to other ghost light tales. Now, supposedly, sometime after the Civil War, a train conductor named Joe Baldwin was taken out near Mako Station during an accident with a caboose and a runaway railway car. After noticing the stranded car, he had run to the rear of the train to signal the next locomotive coming up behind him, frantically waving his lantern. The warning was not seen, however, and the accident whack, decapitated Baldwin. After that, a mysterious light began appearing nightly along the Wilmington and Manchester Railroad, bobbing up and down about five feet above the train tracks. The apparition was typically white, although it was sometimes reported as green or red. Witnesses said that its notion resembled that of a person carrying a lantern. The Mako light was said to be the spirit of Joe Baldwin, searching for his missing head. Sightings typically concluded when the light faded away into the distance or shot off one side of the track. It is a tale we have heard time and time again, the headless conductor doomed to wander the earth. However, unlike many ghost light sightings, the Mako light has caused dozens of real-world consequences. 
Trains were often delayed or stopped after seeing the light in the distance, thinking it might be a person on the road or another locomotive. In fact, debunkers wrote off the Mako light as refractions from car headlights on neighboring U.S. Route 74. Supposedly, one particular bend in the road would cause the illusion that there was a light above the railroad. This, of course, does not explain sightings prior to the rise of automobiles, but might sometimes explain sightings in more recent times. It does not, however, explain the harrowing encounter reported by a U.S. Army colonel and his detachment of soldiers from Fort Bragg, about two hours north. You see, in the 40s, a Colonel Thompson became so intrigued by rumors of the light that he decided to lead a band of his own men onto the tracks to determine what the cause might be once and for all. Colonel Thompson hand-selected his crew, all World War II veterans, unlikely to be spooked by any tomfoolery. They visited the railroad for three consecutive nights. Now, the first two evenings, Joe Baldwin must have stayed hidden. The third night, however, things got a little crazy, and they all got more than they bargained for. In the far distance, a single light swaying and swinging back and forth manifested above the tracks, its beams glinting off the rails. From all appearances, it looked as if somebody was walking towards them, carrying a lantern. Colonel Thompson leapt into action, deploying his men in a skirmish formation. He planned to encircle and entrap whoever was responsible. Slowly and cautiously, they advanced. And as they drew nearer, even the battle-hardened veterans felt a tinge of fear. Something about this light simply wasn't right. Continued. Then, all of a sudden, the light simply winked out of sight. Everybody was dumbfounded. They froze in their tracks as the suffocating darkness of the night fell upon them once more. Then... From the rear of the group, a voice, Look behind us, Colonel, said one of the men. Turning, the soldiers all saw the light in the distance to their rear. Only someone possessing superhuman speed and silence could have managed to douse the light and run around them, not even being seen or heard. Nor had they seen anyone waiting where the light was now, if an accomplice was involved. Now, it was as if one of two things had happened. Either the light had shut off, flown over them, and landed on the other side of them, or it had somehow passed through their formation invisibly. Now, some distance down the track, the light simply proceeded down the line, bobbing lazily as it had moments before. According to the story, the soldiers went home the following day, every one of them mystified except for Colonel Thompson. He simply denied the evidence of his own eyes and instead insisted that a rational explanation for the Mako lights must exist. Sadly, we have no sightings of that light since 1977. That year, the railroad tracks were removed. Since then, the Mako light has failed to reappear, and we can only hope that Joe Baldwin found his head before the tracks were taken away. And more importantly, I want to know what you guys think. Are the Mako lights truly something of the supernatural realm, or are they easily explained away? Is the legend behind the Witch of Eden Town something that's real, or simply folklore and legend? Is there something truly mysterious that happened to the lost colony of Roanoke? I'll let you be the judge. Hunting Island State Park is just one example of the vast territories found in the state. And Hunting Island State Park in South Carolina is an undeveloped stretch of land that is home to loggerhead turtles, deer, diamondback rattlesnakes, and other wildlife, as known by David's story. Now, it is known for its natural environment and has made its way into the list of America's top 10 beaches, believe it or not. Now, the park gets a lot of visitors year-round and part-time to enjoy the miles of pristine white sand beach as well as explore the well-known Hunting Island Lighthouse. But in August of 2022, there was one sighting of Bigfoot in Hunting Island State Park that would kick off a variety of reports highlighting Bigfoot's presence in the state of South Carolina. As told by one of the three siblings who was present during the following events, the story begins like this. On Tuesday, August 2nd, 2022, my brother, sister, and I were visiting the lighthouse at South Carolina's Hunting Island State Park. 
the three witnesses were visiting a pretty monumental attraction, as the Hunting Island Lighthouse is the only publicly accessible lighthouse in South Carolina. Now, the three siblings explored the lighthouse and then left. They were traveling along the exit road to the lighthouse in the afternoon. My brother was driving the vehicle, with me riding in the front passenger seat and my sister being in the rear driver's side seat. The vehicle traveled along, but this fun trip would soon come to a shocking sight. While rounding a curve on the road, all three of the witnesses would come face to face with a creature quickly striding some feet in front of their vehicle. The creature was walking upright, taking strides quickly to our left and disappearing into the brush on the left side of the road directly in front of us. It was a very quick sighting, but one that would still come with significant details. Perhaps the most crucial aspect to solidify the validity of this sighting, one of the witnesses was Dr. Bob Frady, a retired forensic psychologist. Now, with his experience in forensics and having a keen eye when it came to details such as odors and hair variations, Dr. Frady was able to give a pretty thorough report of the creature's physical features. This was especially a feat considering the sighting had been so brief, lasting only a couple of seconds at most. Now, Dr. Frady describes the creature with a height estimated as being between five to six feet tall. Legs were approximately three feet long, human length jointed knee with dark brown, splotchy black hair, approximately two inches long. There were no sounds or odors noticed by any of us. Now, Dr. Frady and his siblings had been visiting State Island Park since the 50s and they were rightly shocked at this experience, as a sighting like this had never occurred before. It is also important to note that all three siblings saw the creature at the same time and gave the exact same physical description of the creature. Now, Dr. Brady gave a sightings report to the Bigfoot Field Research Organization, also known as BFRO. The BFRO investigator, Matt Moneymaker, who is also the president, took Dr. Frady's report and put the sighting in the Class A category, which is the organization's highest ranking. However, even this experience seemed to upturn the BFRO's classification system. Moneymaker even stated, this was in daylight, 20 feet in front of the car. This is not just a class A, but an A+. Now, in the report, Moneymaker also noted that this is the first multi-witness sighting, highly reliable, of a Sasquatch close to the shoreline of the Atlantic Ocean. Now, when asked about the report Dr. Freddy had made with the park ranger just after the creature's sighting, he said he hadn't heard back from the state and really didn't expect to. Working in government, I know as things go up in the chain of command, things tend to be squashed. No pun intended. But did Dr. Frady ever second-guess the being and his siblings saw on that fateful August day? Not at all. In fact, Brady would love to keep his own investigation into the matter going, it seems. He says, If it had half a dozen biologists out there, I'm a scientist, and I would give anything to find some more data on it. I know it was there. Now, Hunting Island State Park in South Carolina does get a lot of tourist attraction. It is the most visited state park in the entire state of South Carolina. However, it seems this park may be a hotbed to the strange and even downright paranormal. Witness accounts relay the sight of phantoms in the lighthouse, including a lighthouse keeper who is still desperate to save a drowned boy. Campers who have stayed a night at the campgrounds available in the park have also reported hearing strange, loud sounds, including phantom voices. Now, Hunting Island itself has a rich history, as this thick, forested area of land was first used as a hunting preserve for planters and elite alike. And during the 19th and 20th centuries, a variety of game was hunted on the island and was not developed into a state park until the era of the Great Depression. With such a long and robust history under its belt, it should come as no surprise that perhaps the island inhabits more macabre and paranormal energies than tourists and locals even know. The environment on the island, along with its vast forest and white beaches, 
may appeal to some other beings, such as Sasquatch, seen in the encounter above. Now, this major sighting in South Carolina would be one of two sightings for the year of 2022, because just a month earlier, in July 5th, a professional forester would reach out to the BFRO to make his own report of a chilling encounter with what he believes was a Sasquatch. Now, this sighting occurred near a power line cut near the town of Clover in York County. It has been stated in the BRFRO report that Bigfoot sightings can be pretty common near power line cuts. The witness stated this, I was walking in the power line cut near Daimler Boulevard. At around 2 p.m. today, I heard loud knocking sounds coming from both sides of the cut. Now, it didn't sound mechanical, but like wood on wood. And each time I heard one, I would then hear another as if in response. Now, this would not be the only strange occurrence, however. The forester also noticed a large depression in a certain area of grass, which could indicate a large being had been sleeping or bedding down there for a considerable portion of time. There was also a peculiar and foul smell in the area. It is safe to say that Bigfoot has long hung around the state of South Carolina, and there are witness reports that go back years and years and years. Now, in 2007, BFRO published a report on a sighting that occurred in the town of Bluffton, Beaufort County, which is also the same county where the Hunting Island State Park is located, believe it or not. The story of this encounter begins one humid, warm day in May, when the witness and a family member were in the family member's home watching TV. The windows were open to let a breeze into the home, and at one point, the family member had nodded off so the witness was the only one awake. There had been a light rain earlier, and the witness said this, I had heard the sound of something outside the window, although it sounded similar to what car tires sound like driving on wet pavement from far away, it was not. I heard a fairly long exhale of breath from just outside the window as if somebody was standing outside looking directly in. Now, this would leave the witness confused and uneasy, and rightfully so. Whoever was making that exhale would have to be only three or four feet away and would have to be pretty tall to not be in the witness's line of sight. Now, suddenly, there was another long exhale. Eager to get rid of whoever was stalking the property, the witness just began to yell out, Get out! Get out! To whoever or whatever was making these exhales. They even ran to the front of the house to warn off the intruder, waking up their family member and dog in the process. However... This would not be the last of the sighting. As the witness explained the next day, they went out to walk around the property in search of deer scat, and as they thought perhaps a deer had just been on the property and the presence of a tree near the house may have been what enticed the wildlife. Now, this would not be the case. The witness describes that they came upon there, literally right up against the corner of the house, less than one foot from the wall of the house, as if something had been standing facing the house and leaning against it, was one barefooted human-shaped footprint at least 12 inches long and 6 inches wide and about an inch or two deep. Now, the footprint was made on a dirt mound from where the bushes had been planted. Now, what convinced the witness that the being was standing against the corner of the house was there was only one right footprint and no left one. Now, about the footprint, the witness states this. On the right footprint, the odd thing about it was that I couldn't find the little toe. All the other ones were clearly marked. Also, the reason that the print may have been deeper on the left side of the print rather than on the right side of the print was that the thing must have been leaning to the left around the corner of the house to look into the window. This chilling account may hint that if there are any creatures among us, they are just as curious about us as we are of them. Now, one sighting of Bigfoot was recorded to have taken place in 2017. And when it comes to sightings of Sasquatch, these can occur in any islands or the mainland that comprise South Carolina. This 2017 incident stems around Greenville. 
The local police actually had to issue an official public safety warning after this sighting in McDowell County, North Carolina, which lies near the border between the two states. In terms of the sighting, a witness claimed to have seen the face of the Sasquatch along with the creature's matted and stringy hair. Though there were no photos, of course, the description from the witness alone was enough to throw an entire community into unease. On March 1st, 2015, the Carolina Cryptid crew uploaded a one-minute audio clip of what they claimed to be a Bigfoot howling. <laughs> This upload would bring much controversy when it came to the belief of whether Sasquatch creatures really were inhabiting South Carolina. There has not been much audio captured of these creatures, so this audio is a great opportunity to try and listen to Bigfoot himself, along with the infamous Ohio Howl, if you know what that is. Now, who exactly are the Carolina Cryptid Crew? The group itself was founded in 2013 by Carrie George, and George grew up in South Carolina. The particular county she grew up in has lived through a numerous amount of Sasquatch encounters on its own. Now, George remembers growing up listening to the stories of Bigfoot and was catapulted into the theories and research of Bigfoot at a young age after being recommended a book by a librarian. However, Carrie George would not come into contact with the creature itself until adulthood in 2013. This was while walking through the woods of that same county to investigate reports of sightings in the area. Now, George says that she and other family members were walking along a trail when a hairy ape-like creature appeared from behind nearby brush. We stared at each other for what seemed like forever, but in reality, I'm sure it was no more than a few seconds. Then it just turned around and left. It was about seven feet tall, definitely a small one covered in red fur, and not at all what I expected I would see when I finally did get to see one of these creatures. Now, since 2013, the Carolina Cryptid Crew has taken a scientific approach when it comes to collecting evidence of the existence of Big Feet. George stresses that all evidence collection is done in the most sterile and professional way possible. So, has the group of researchers found anything that could imply Bigfoot exist? Now, according to George, some of the evidence they've collected includes hair and scat samples, audio recordings of Sasquatch vocalizations, photographs of numerous bedding sites, and even two plaster castings of what are said to be Sasquatch prints. Now, when it comes to Bigfoot's intelligence, George, like other researchers, estimates that Sasquatch creatures are highly intelligent, considering they may be able to build nests like monkeys and other primates. I'm not sure how intelligent they are, but I believe if we ever get the chance to research them in a closed environment, we will find their intelligence is closer to human than any other animal. Now, it may not come as a surprise to everyone to know that Bigfoot's history with South Carolina runs pretty far. According to locals, the county in South Carolina with the most Bigfoot sightings is the same county we've been talking about, Oconee County. There have been Bigfoot sightings in this county alone as early as 1975, when a witness ran into what they believe was the Sasquatch on a walk through Lake Kiawe. I'm hoping I'm saying that right. The witness described the creature as not human at all, at least seven to eight feet tall and 450 pounds, no neck and reddish in color. Now the creature had quickly panicked and ran away from the witness who described its yell like the death wail of a pig or cow. On the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, there are about 55 Bigfoot encounters recorded on the site alone. Now, this does not include any sightings that may not have been recorded either. The earliest Bigfoot sighting recorded in South Carolina through BFRO seems to be from the year 64 in Hampton County. 
This is a pretty chilling tale relayed by the sibling of the witness. Now, my brother Doug S. was out camping with friends one Friday night. It was late, and my grandmother and I were watching TV. Doug suddenly burst into the house, scared and wild-eyed. Bigfoot! Bigfoot! He came in yelling. Bigfoot ran us off! Now, Doug had come running in with his shotgun, but had relayed that he'd been too terrified to even shoot it in case it retaliated and tried to kill him, so he ran. Now, Doug had explained that while he and his friends had gotten a campfire going, they'd heard a lot of noise in the darkness. Suddenly, a tall and hairy man-like creature had appeared before them, which scared the group and forced them to run off. Doug and his siblings returned to the campsite the following day for his belongings, and his siblings recount Doug looking around as they walked completely petrified. This was completely out of character for Doug. Once arriving at the campsite, the two siblings would be in for a shocking image. The camp was torn up. Their stuff was scattered about everywhere. The campfire was scattered about as well, and there were strange footprints showing toes all over the dirt. Later, the pair had tried to get their grandfather into the woods to see the footprints, but the man refused. The story of the young boy's encounter spread all over the county and was met with much controversy. However, a week after the incident, there would be a phone call made to the house where Doug and his family resided. It would be another Hampton resident letting them know that the encounters a truck driver had with Bigfoot while out on the road. The truck driver had run into Bigfoot on the road and had braked to stop to avoid hitting the creature. Now, the Sasquatch had then gotten close to the truck and interacted with it, either banging on the door or jumping on the hood. Whatever the interaction it was, it's safe to say the driver was terrified fleeing the scene. In fact, the truck driver's story was run by the Hampton County Guardian afterward. It seems perhaps Bigfoot has an affinity with the state of South Carolina. One that has seen these Sasquatch creatures running through the state for decades now, looking at the timeline of each encounter. From 1964 to 2022, there have been recorded events of weary locals and tourists running into this evasive and at times aggressive creature. The question is why? Now, is South Carolina just shrouded in more mysteries than many of us have thought? Are all these strange encounters and places connected in what could ultimately be a hot spot for high strangeness and otherworldly creatures? There is definitely something that is amiss when it comes to Morgan Island. Now listen to this. Off the coast of Beaufort, South Carolina lies a patch of land known as Morgan Island. Morgan Island, also known by some locals and tourists as Monkey Island, is made up of more than 2,000 acres of untouched land. Getting to this island would take a boat trip, but unfortunately, for any curious tourist and or locals, this island is completely closed off to the public and has been for many years now. Here's a bit more on why this island may not make it into your next vacation itinerary. Morgan Island is known by many in South Carolina to house a population of more than 4,000 rhesus monkeys. However, one questionable event has led many to wonder if this isolated land houses more than mere monkeys. Perhaps some creatures unknown to man may be roaming the island as well. But before we dive into how this theory of strange creatures came to be, here's a quick backstory behind the island and how it came to be such a solitary place where no human is allowed to step inside. Now, to start with, the island is actually owned by the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources and has been kept closed to the public since the late 1970s. This is because during that time, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases would use the island to conduct a variety and a series of experiments. Can you guess who the subjects of these experiments were? Now, in the year 1979, about 1,400 give or take Reese's monkeys were placed on the land to be used as test subjects for the Institute's experiments. The population on the island over time boomed to about 4,000 and were then deemed no longer useful. So what would end up becoming of all these monkeys? As far as anyone knows, these monkeys still inhabit the land. 
and are regularly fed by an automated system. Now, no human trespassers are allowed on the island, so if you were hoping to hang out with some monkeys, you may just be out of luck. However, the question remains, is the island so private to keep humans from seeing just the monkeys? Are there perhaps some experiments still being run that the general public may not be aware of? Or are there other creatures inhabiting the island that may be best kept away from the other populations? However, it's important to not forget that South Carolina has been a prominent spot when it comes to Bigfoot. Now, this lore has surrounded the state so much that there is even an annual Bigfoot festival held every year to entertain guests and visitors and share some of the story and lore behind the legend. There are still plenty of questions remaining when it comes to Bigfoot and its presence in South Carolina. Now, some of these questions include, is there a big Bigfoot population? Does the mysterious and elusive Morgan Island have any role in these creatures' presence? With this very recent Bigfoot sighting happening in 2022, is it safe to say another Bigfoot sighting won't take long to occur? All these questions and more remain when it comes to the Palmetto State. I don't know when we will get answers, but hopefully we will learn a little more in time. But more importantly, I want to know what you guys think. Be sure to let me know in the comments down below. I would love to hear from all of you. Also, if you're a fan of storytelling of the mysterious and supernatural, be sure to go ahead and smack that like and subscribe button for more content just like this. And as always, I love you all. Keep an open mind, and I'll catch you guys in the very next video.